Okay. Welcome everybody. And thank you for joining me for yet another free coaching call. I love these calls so much. Uh, they allow me to, you know, get in the feedback loop with uh, people who are um, the people that I'm trying to help uh, that um, hopefully can also tell me more about what's going on, you know, in, in the academic life that uh, I left behind for greener pastures for myself, but as you can see, I can't, I can't quite quit. Um, I love thinking about academic writing and working with academic writers. Uh, my name is Dr. Shalon Chachaf. I um, am a writing and creativity coach. I specialize in um, creative unblocking for academic writing, um, which comes out of my trajectory as uh, uh, previously extremely at the same time, blocked and prolific academic writer, which I think a lot of people can probably identify with, because even as you work um, and you publish and you are building a body of, of, of work, um, a lot of us often face obstacles to a smooth ride. Now, let me ask you just this, uh, is the light behind me uh, in interfering with the picture? Yeah, no, it's, yes, okay. no, it's good. Okay. Well, let me do, I think, let me do that, this one thing because there's a little brightness. You can't really count on, it was nice and kind of cloudy and now the sun come out, came out, which is nice, but it can become very, all right. So let me know if, uh, if anything um, in my setup is distracting or annoying. All right, so uh, I'm recording this, so I'm just letting everybody know that's on the call. I really am envisioning this as a, co a, a real coaching call, meaning I want you guys to tell me what your questions are, what you're dealing with, et cetera, so that uh, you can kind of see what it, uh, well, first of all, you can get the free coaching and you can, I mean, honestly, I've, I've had somebody on this last call that ended up not taking the class because she said, I'm good, I'm unblocked. So many of you might know that working with me can happen really fast. I still recommend taking the class. And so uh, today I will be talking about my, uh, my upcoming series, but no strings attached. The class already made, so we have uh, enough to move forward with the class. Uh, but of course, I want as many people to be able to join. I have to thank Yael who got the uh, class he, on the call here. Yael enjoyed the class so much. That now that she's, can I say, Yael, can I tell everybody what, what happened? She, she's in an administrative position and she encouraged her um, people that she's administrating to, to use research money that she authorized for them to use to take the class. So this is the best possible recommendation that somebody uh, enjoy. And Yael, can you, are you okay? I'm putting you on the spot because I'm so excited with your news. Can you share what happened today? Oh yeah, yes. I'll just say that they're my colleagues, like lateral colleagues rather than oh, okay. people I'm administrating. Yeah, you're an administrator, so you're, no. you're in a position of so, holding yeah. the, the decision over funds. <laughs> So, um, what was I going to say? I need to go oh, back. To what I, yes. So I got a. So while I was in the course, I started like reworking on taking out again an old paper that needed to get done and hadn't worked on very much of it yet and wrote it, almost finished it during the course, finished it after, submitted it by the end of August when the course finished mid August. Anyway, I already got back reviews, which was very fast. But uh, wow. it's also common. very uncommon, right? Uh, yeah, to to it was really fast. So that's nice. A very fast turnaround in a journal, a top journal in your field, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was in uh, race and ethnic studies, I think. Yeah, and so one of the comments, amongst a whole bunch of comments and suggestions and stuff, some of the, one of the reviewers wrote, the introduction is really compelling and written beautifully. Well done. And that was nice. That is yes. something I worked on a lot in the course. So. Right, we worked on the introduction. I remember you were workshopping towards the end of the class. We get so that's part of what I will talk about today is how um, how I, I like to work with academic writers. By at first we kind of go through the emotional, psychological, cognitive trifecta of what gets people blocked as as academic, as writers in general, but also as academic writers. And then in the second half of the class, we delve into 
work, you know, uh, craft and style elements and the building blocks of an academic paper and how to get yourself through from A to Z from, you know, learning that there is a process that doesn't necessarily look like what you think the process is. Um, learning the different stages of the process, learning to accept that some days your work is to take a walk and and just contemplate a, a sticky point in your argument. And another day your work is to just make index cards and, and, and sit during the confusion, right? And then other times, as Yael is now uh, telling us, that the, it's the time to really polish the lead for an article and understand what the lead for an article can do and how you wanna balance between the lead being enticing for a reader, or in other words, not to bore the reader, right? And to just build a bridge especially with academic writing so many times we are so in our topic and we can kind of forget to build that bridge for a reader even if it's in a, a journal in our field we know that our field fall our fields fall into more and more subcategories right so often and this is actually i remember yeah i see i'm not remembering when we talked about it we talked about how understanding how to write a good lead for a journal article could be useful for something like a job talk because these things are not, you know, are, 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 can be very similar because it's the question of how do I use narrative techniques and techniques of storytelling. Uh, but unlike when you're just in the creative writing world, which is a one, wonderful world, and I love that world and I'm in it, now I do a lot of creative nonfiction. But as an academic writer, you are tasked with uh, a couple of different agendas, whenever you talk about your scholarship or you write about your scholarship, et cetera, um, you need to be, uh, as, uh, assert yourself as a, you know, a authority in your field, or at least enough to uh, forward an argument. You need to report on data. You need to have already done original research. And all of these are just prerequisites, right? And then you need to take a reader by the hand and do things like construct a bridge uh, for the reader so that it's easy for the reader to understand what's at stake, why they should spend the time reading your research. Um, and you know, it's nice, most of us really don't want to do it in a way that's dry and boring, but that can add to our um, burden as perfectionist writers, as most of us are very much burdened with perfectionism. I can talk a little bit more about that later, how uh, academic writers are more prone than average to face debilitating perfectionism and what in the academic environment fosters that, right? So we don't want to be boring. We want it to be scintillating and we want it to be uh, in compelling. And yet we also have to show that we're entering a conversation in the field. We need to construct. So really writing the introduction for any piece of work uh, or writing a proposal, right? So writing the introduction, writing the, uh, a job talk or writing a proposal for a project can be very hard, but also very useful as an exercise for understanding from A to Z what your project is going to do. So in uh, back to Yael, as we were uh, working on uh, when we got into the craft, if, yeah, if you're okay with it, right? When we got to the craft part of the class, we did get to workshop specific things and Yael brought that article that she was just mentioning. Um, and together we kind of uh, tweaked and played and we looked at, if I remember correctly, we looked at two uh, different possible ways to write the lead for the article. And can you remind me what, what did I did? I did read the, the draft, but can you share with everybody what 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 we're now saying? Those of you who are just joining, yeah, Elle took my class last summer. Now a publication from the class has been uh, basically received with minor minor revisions, and she got a compliment that it was well written and the introduction very compelling. So uh, can you remind me what the or and tell or share what the choices were that you made? about writing that introduction? I'm trying to remember. I mean, I know that it was using two of the models that Sharon shared with us around how to do structural work. Um, and interestingly, I feel like I'm advertising for the course, but I guess like the best thing I will say is that like, I'm still joining the talk even though I've already taken the course because I feel like that these talks are useful. 
Um, so I'm coming Thank here to advertise, of course, for my own benefit. But I think the there were a, a few different structural kind of heuristics or tools that Sharon shared with us and I was using them to try to analyze what I had already written and I felt like something about the argument didn't just it just felt boring to me like I felt like the argument was solid but it was dull and so I kind of tried to use those tools to analyze how I had already written it and then I tried to come up with an alternative and that's what I brought to the group to like workshop a little bit together it was like using those uh yeah techniques or heuristics to analyze and create um yeah the structure of a piece and then i got a little bit of feedback in that discussion in the class from sharon and from like particularly one other person in the group and then i actually the feedback was recommending i go back to my original structure but write it in a way that was maybe more compelling and more using storytelling techniques and oh, I, yes, I remember towards, the narrative. yeah so i had been leaning towards using the alternative structure but the feedback i got was like no the original structure actually makes sense and is good and it makes your argument well so just think about how can you tell this more as a story and that's what i did and that's what i got the good feedback on in the review that's fantastic. Now, I, I mean, I remember the, the, so, you know, I remember Yale because you are, uh, you're more advanced. You're a full professor, uh, akin to full associate professor. professor. Associate professor. Uh, it's a different uh, structure because you're in Norway. Right? Yeah. So, so it's like you come in, the entry level job is already a tenured job. So this is, which, yeah. I mean, we can all hope and dream that we get to the European structure one day, but meanwhile, it's going the other way. But I remember in the class, the feedback was, and this is something that happens in the class a lot, you know, we have people that are just working on their dissertation or maybe, maybe even early PhD students all the way up to you. And it was very clear that it was no problem for you out the gate to write the very condensed, beautiful abstract thing that goes like, bam, 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 what I need to set up for people to understand that I know what I'm doing, I know how to get an argument, I know how to convey that I did the research and put together a research question, a, you know, a topic, what I'm asking about the topic, what I did to answer about it. But when you had it so packed and tight, it was less inviting for a reader in, in terms of, you know, so we, we said this could go in the second paragraph. And in the first paragraph, you had told us a story about how you came about uh, stumbling onto the, the research, which was a, a classroom experience that you experienced that, if I remember correctly, right, it was that mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you realized I, I, the gap between uh, your students thinking that race is not an issue for them, some, some sort of, right? And so it was a compelling personal story that said, this happened to me and it connected with my research agenda and here comes the research. And so that created the difference and it's beautiful to see. And, and you know what, with my experience, and again, I did a lot, I really loved editing um, and putting together panels and, and getting, competitive panels to go into uh, conferences. And really what makes the difference so many times, like the research can be the same, but what really makes the difference, whether your paper is going to get accepted to that prestigious project is whether or not you can put together a really compelling abstract uh, that doesn't just check all the boxes, but also tells a story that builds that bridge to explain what's at stake. And so oftentimes it's those, um, the things that we as academics don't get as much training on, the narrative um, uh, theory or the narrative hacks and the little. So I think now I'm remembering we, uh, we definitely looked at uh, draft number four, which is this, oh, sorry, this book by John McPhee on uh, the writing process. And we took, we, I think we, we looked at the lead from this, but also John Franklin, uh, here's another book. Uh, on story. So these are two Pulitzer winner, you know, a Pulitzer winner uh, journalists who wrote books about uh, writing. And so part of what I do, as I started working more on academic writers and working with academic writers, I realized the degree to which the very few books we do have on academic writing are not sufficient. And most of them are not great in terms of the advice they give. Um, it's, it's either limited 
or, um, there, you know, or I'm, I'm not trying to say nobody ever wrote a good book about, you know, there are some useful books, but uh, they do not tap into a world of knowledge that is out there about the writing process. So I bring together uh, work from books like uh, this one on being stuck by Lauren Herring, which is a wonderful book. And she's in you know, yoga and meditation and mindfulness and, and writing and creativity teacher. Um, and um, books like this one, uh, Thinking Like Your Editor, that was written by a, a two edi uh, I think an editor and an agent who are talking about how to uh, propose a nonfiction um, what we call serious nonfiction. So not an academic monograph, but a book about your research that's uh, intended for a wider audience. So, again, ser serious nonfiction um, and how to write great serious nonfiction and get it published. So for example, this you know, is a book that it's not within the academic worldview of how to write, but it can be such a useful tool for you as you think about your writing and you're trying to, um, develop your craft. So I'm highlighting craft today because I often, and I'm sure uh, in the remainder of the, the call too, you will see that I really, um, I balance two things, but I usually pay a lot more attention definitely early on to the writer's block, the academic writer's block. Uh, but what we do in uh, work with me in class and what I'm inviting you guys to you know, ask about today uh, because you do not have to take the class. You're not, you know, it's, this is, this is, I love these events and obviously I'm, I'm doing more of those free events when I'm promoting a class, but, uh, and I would love to give more information about the class today. Uh, but I'm also building this platform for, platform for wider things. I'm writing this as a book project. Um, I have my YouTube channel where I uh, give free advice for academic writers. So, uh, it's kind of realistic. And as you can, I think, see, I'm also just, this is my passion. I, I'm aligning with my passion, which is to help academic writers reconnect with the inner passion and joy, right? So what got us, this is my spiel that a lot of time, you know, you might've heard in my other videos. What gets us stuck is that we get disconnected with what got us writing scholarship to begin with, right? So a lot of us, uh, could have gone into other more lucrative careers, right? And, uh, or still could. Uh, and we chose this life. We chose going into academia because we have something that we want to say. There's a contribution. And us, our unique voice, our unique contribution is, is burning inside, right? And, and we want to express that unique creative contribution. Um, because I, I, absolutely believe that writing research is a creative pursuit, you know? And so a lot of the time when people start struggling, it's because the circumstances and the conditions within which we produce scholarship um, disconnect us or, you know, create a disconnect, a disconnect between the passion that we had for what we wanted to say and between um, the Oh, sorry, I'm trying to do speaker view and for some reason it's uh, too, for me it's showing you L. <laughs> okay, here we go. So between that passion that we had about a contribution that we wanted to uh, share with the world and between the lived reality of this is a job and we're teaching and doing service and we need to do this and that and you know, maybe we had um, you know, a couple of, of kids or you know, we're taking care of people in our lives and things start not adding up and we start struggling and so many times, you know, you're not gonna be struggling with your teaching because it's scheduled, regular activity that you gotta show up for. And there's an accountability loop, right? You're gonna be in the class, you know you wanna be prepared. And also you become a very professional person that can just go in the class and wing it even if you're not as prepared. Um, and, you know, hopefully most of us don't let too much fuckery happen with the people that we take care of in our lives. So, and then service, again, is kind of a loop where we got to show those other stakeholders, if we said we're going to do something in the department or in the field, you know, we do it. So where do we usually start struggling when things get too hectic? It's in our writing. It's in our writing, in our publishing. I can't tell you how many people per week 
you know, I talked down from a complete panic attack uh, that surrounds, um, oh, I see the chat, sorry. I, I get, um, I'll, I'll post the links on, on, on my group. If everybody's on Academic Writers and Blog, I will try to post the links for all the books that I'm mentioning today. Yes, On Being Stuck by Lorraine Herring. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just post the, those links later. So I, I'm really uh, not very good at following the chat as, as long as I speak. So I talk people down every week who are just panicking about their writing. And a lot of the time what happens is it becomes a source of anguish. It becomes this thing we're failing at. Uh, at any given time, an academic writer that feels blocked may be doing whatever, but they're also not writing. You know what I mean? It's like, I am with my kids in the park, but in my mind, I am not writing. I am preparing for classes, but in my mind, I am not writing. So that chronic situation where you're constantly feeling like you're falling short and you're constantly feeling like you should be writing, right? I should be writing, I should be working. It ends up being this chronicle drain that really just depletes your energies that should be available for that creative process of writing. Shame, guilt, self-admonishment, these are not good bedfellows for the writing process. And so, so often I see academic writers just being eaten up alive by, um, you know, by, by all of these emotions. And on the other hand, so this is a time to critique my uh, beloved uh, friend and mentor, uh, Evetazo Bevel, who wrote Clockwork Muse, one of the only uh, really good books, I think, for academic writers. Uh, and Megan and, and Yael, I'm sorry, I know I mentioned some of these books in the last call. Um, but, you know, I was talking to Evita, and he's uh, about to retire from Rutgers. He's, you know, a, a very well-respected sociologist, and he wrote this book, and this is in Harvard Press. It's one of their most ever sold books. And it was really interesting because he does not believe that such a thing exists as a writer's block for academics. It's just a cognitive issue, he said. If you learn how to organize your time, the block doesn't exist. By, you know, my experience, well, a couple of things. He's an older... Well, Israeli, European, Jew, you know what I mean? So a lot of uh, things that were, I don't want to say something mean, like, oh, he's privileged, like that's a bad thing. He worked hard all his life, but the world in which he operated, where anybody could just, you know, do the work and, and it's going to be okay and you're going to live a beautiful life with a great salary and you're going to, you know, get a lot of students and create a generation of PhD students. All of that is not really exactly how things are now for most of us in academia, right? The precarity that we're feeling. Um, and again, I don't want to make it too depressing, but anybody read about Ithaca College with the three, uh, 130 uh, faculty tenured that were discontinued uh, this week? Yes. So it's just already it's precarious and not just those who are precariously employed are precarious, right? Even those of us who are in tenure, uh, tenured or tenured pr uh, track position, we're feeling the burn. So the world where this clockwork news, oh, we will solve the problem if we will just learn how to organize our time. Um, is no longer the world in which most of us operate. So with that, I am tired of my own voice and I would really love to hear if anybody wants to introduce themselves and maybe uh, get us going, tell us where you know the writing is, what's going on. And here's another question I have for those of you in attendance. And I see that I know that a lot, you know, not everybody wants to um, uh, go on video. And I can also pause your the recording if you really feel like you're going to say something implicating for yourself. Uh, but you can also just talk in audio. And here's my um, my um, my question. I am curious about COVID times specifically, and the way the semester is going right now. So a lot of you, uh, and you can answer in the chat. I'm assuming this is uh, coming on the if you're in a semester. Uh, schedule. This is coming on the middle of the semester. It's before the big midterms and everything, right? Uh, so here's the reason I'm asking. I, when I was thinking about the timing for this class, I understand the academic schedule. And what I think happens in the fall semester is, you know, 
in every semester. We dream about writing. If we don't have a regular, uh, sustainable, no drama, no nonsense writing practice that's just very low key and just a regular part of your life, then you're not writing, right? You're like, oh, I'm, I, I should be doing this, I should be doing that, and you're starting to freak out. You're about to be hit with a lot of grading, and then you start fantasizing about the writing that you will do during the break. Now, I was envisioning this class as, okay, maybe you are a professor or a precariously employed academic or you're working on your dissertation and you have this semester. You can do something small for yourself. And so I actually downsized, you know, I made the class longer so that the individual units are shorter. You can do 25 minutes a week of a presentation that would be pre-recorded and then join a one hour workshop on a Sunday during the semester and you're taking care of your writing, you're starting to build a writing process, you're starting to look and become mindful, uh, you know, and workshop your project. And then we carry you through, right? So the first five weeks, we're, we're looking at the emotional, cognitive, writer's block, procrastination, anxiety, depression, imposter syndrome, all of these things together. And we kind of start also introducing those very, and yeah, I can tell you a little bit more about it, very simple interventions. I call them interventions, right? Gleaned from the literature. And again, here are some of the books. Um, you know, the literature about the writing process, about the creative uh, uh, process. Uh, this book that I really like to highlight uh, on writer's block by Victoria Nelson. We read a lot of that book. Uh, she's a, a, a PhD in psychology and a therapist. Uh, hang on, I'm admitting a couple more people. So we do that work and we workshop our our blocks. And we start, but at the same time, we also introduce some interventions that allow us to gradually build through morning pages and journaling and just creating a ritual, finding out, we, we work um, on analyzing your relationship with time. What is the right time for you? How are you you know, how can you align best with the, not the perceived reality that you're fantasizing that one day everybody's gonna go away and you're gonna have endless time to write, but your real life, you know, between the dishes and the laundry and the teaching and whatever else you have going and COVID and all of that, right? So all of this to say, right, uh, I wanna hear from you if this fantasy that I have about the timing of this course uh, resonates, because my idea was let's get people to the break and then during the break we were already knee deep in the craft argument workshopping or uh, it's not like people are going to read your 300 pages dissertation no this is not you know this is made up right so again as yael was telling you uh, us about the article we didn't read the entire article i mean i read a draft because yael also took a, a coaching well yeah I, I skimmed a draft but people didn't um yet workshopping those structural argument craft things, the style of the thing was really useful for her to finish and get something published that was stuck for how many years before the class? Some years, right? So yeah, yeah, it's just like, yeah, I'm gonna just say some years. Yeah, no, I, I had not, yeah, I hadn't published anything for uh, four and a half years. Yep, but I mean, I'm not in a publisher. Parish. Yeah, this is the second article I submitted this year. All right. Now so I'm working from, on another one. From nothing in years to two already. So that's, yeah, you're my poster. <laughs> you're my poster child. My, right? Everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and this is what happens. And it happens fast. When you work with me, what can I, what can I do? What can I say? I do have a knack for that. And the reason is, I think, if I may, you know, we are so starved for any sort of a space that would not be judgy, that would not be just constantly asking you to prove your worth, and we just assume, I assume before we start, that you are worthy. You know, I don't just assume it, I know it. I know that, you know, you didn't get yourself into a PhD program and defended and into the job, right, in a job, even if, the, I know the market right now, we might, some of us don't have the jobs that we wanted to have. And some of us have them and now know that it's a nightmare. You know, I, I had the job that was my dream job and lived a nightmare 
for years during, you know, during that job. So with all of that said, and maybe that's what I will do after, um, if, if I was kind of, I always like to uh, delve a little bit into the PowerPoints and what's behind the paid wall during these coaching calls. So maybe I will look at, uh, um, hang on, let me see, let me share the page. Um, so I have this, this is like the basic, the first class, but I have this one uh, PowerPoint, there you go, writing in academia. Uh, I was thinking of sharing this one later. These are all the different things which makes academia an unforgiving writing environment. So you guys can take a picture of the, of the screen if you want also. Uh, we can talk about this for, for two weeks straight, you know, in th two, two, three hour sessions, I think, can, can only begin to cover, hang on, yeah, let me just, all right. So, you know, we can delve into this later, but, you know, we talk about creative monsters, um, which is a really big uh, concept in the cre creative, um, hang on, how do I get back? I want to see you people. There you go. I lost all my participants. <laughs> Hang on. All right. So, you know, we talk about, but you guys can see it, right? I'm going to assume yes. All right. So we talk about uh, what it does to you as a writer when you're in an environment that uh, is very nurturing for people like advisors and peers and you know, administrators and colleagues and reviewers uh, to abuse you through all sorts of uh, power dynamics. Okay, now I really need to understand how I get you guys back to, uh, oh my goodness, hang on. Well, I, I'm having a Zoom moment here because I can't see, I minimize and cannot see you now. Hang on, let me see. Can somebody unmute to just let me know that you guys are still seeing me? Yep. Okay, good. So I minimized uh, seeing yes. the videos from everybody and now I can't find a way to undo it. Maybe I can just, <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't it interesting? Okay. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah. Bye -bye, girl. That was fun. Okay, we're back. Hey, and part of what I role model is that perfectionism sucks and I don't have to be perfect. <laughs> so, so there you go. Did we also throw people out by doing this? Because more people are rejoining. All right, so um, maybe we can try this fun thing again later. But now I really want to hear uh, from, uh, from some of you, A, about the timing of this, if you agree. And it doesn't mean that you have to take the class yourself, but I'm really curious because with everything else that I do know about the academic schedule, I don't have to try to do this now during COVID. You know, I do have, my kids are at home. They're, you know, we've been at home since March, 24 seven. My husband is also working from home. I had a, a practice that was predicated on the fact that everybody goes away for eight hours a day and whatever little or much I can do, it relied on that solitude. We say in, um, there's, there's a coaching, uh, it's a philosophy that I like. It's called human design. And uh, in human design, we say that uh, solitude is the medium of creativity. Okay, creativity needs, in order for it to be mediated into the world, it, it requires solitude. That went out the window. You know, being 24 seven in the presence of everybody, although those are the people you love best, that's enough to really create a lot of distress um, and just take away from you something that is required for your process. All right, so with that said, who wants to say hi and introduce himself and just ask a question or make a comment? I can introduce myself. Um, <laughs> Since I did, so didn't, since I didn't on the last one, so <laughs> yes, I was, I, I was not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my name is Megan Paramaki Brown. I'm an associate professor of archaeology in Canada, and um, 
uh, I, I'm not sort of typical for an ac academic in that the university I work for uh, is a distance education university and it has been since the 70s. So I've actually been designing and teaching courses online for five years, whereas a lot of my colleagues have been doing it for almost a year now, <laughs> uh, or half a year. Um, oh, so your expertise so, is really needed in that, because I'm sure. Well, I mean, and you're doing archaeology yes, and not education, but it seems to me like yeah, a lot of us can yeah. probably use your, um, you know, what you know. And yes and no, because like just speaking of your um, comments about schedules, um, I we don't work on a semester, so um, we're always going because uh, we're we're asynchronous courses. So that in some ways with how that relates to my writing is we have to develop uh, courses that are up there for extended periods of time that one student could be working through or multiple at any given moment. And so a lot of my course development is quite a bit of writing in addition to video production, stuff like that. And so alongside my research, I have my teaching writing and my research writing. And personally, like, I, I guess I do enough to keep my job. So that's a good thing um, in terms of the production, uh, in terms of um, my research writing and things like that. But I've never been entirely enamored of my process, mainly because one, stopping to think about what my process is, um, which thanks to, I, I came on last week's conversation and it really got me thinking a bit more. And if COVID has, given me anything, it's the time to stop and realize I need to start thinking about this. Um, uh, I'm not going in the field because I, I work internationally. So I really do have my time, my, my schedule of things is completely different from what it normally is in many ways. And so I, I wanted to take the course because it's now my chance to really step back and think about my process and how I'm teaching my students. And I think I mentioned to you last week, the only instruction in the writing process I ever had was, you know, a supervisor saying, okay, go away, work on this from nine till five every day, treat it like a job and come back to me with a final draft sort of thing, right? And I don't want to be the one who replicates that advice to my students. And oftentimes I find I'm passing along tips that I don't think are particularly helpful. So I, I, wow, I want to use this for such to, a, an to learn important that. That's such an important, uh, wow. So, I mean, I don't know if you were, you were done, but I had to stop with that because this is really a couple of things on that. And I think we talked a little bit about that last time, but I think there are few people in the world where they can work on this as a nine to five to begin with, right? So, so part of what you're demonstrating for us is how sometimes normative advice that goes like you should, da, 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 can just, be a very unfortunate kind of backfire you know on people where even if it's delivered with the best intentions because this could have been what you know if there is one thing i can tell you about people and writers and people as writers um is that there are as many writing processes as there are people no two people are alike in their writing process and once you develop your writing process just like what I told you before, right? Uh, I had a writing process that was predicated on my life circumstances and again and again, it's gonna change, that's the point. So you can have a process that really works. When I was child-free and getting my PhD and all I needed to worry about was obsessing about global television, uh, which I did quite uh, successfully. And I could just stay up all night and write to the deadline and commit to too many things and then deliver on them and all of that. that process was not healthy but it was successful but then what happened right i started a tenure track job with a newborn great idea everybody do it try it it's so much fun and then not only did i do that i had another one two years later right and i couldn't stay up all night because i was a nursing mother of two right so all of you know the process I had, which was not a carefully thought out process at all, but was just reactive. Um, but, you know, actually, it's kind of funny because, Megan, I'm thinking about, uh, it, it was not a nine to five. It was a, a midnight to 4 a.m. But, you know, <laughs> and that worked for me and that was wonderful. 
I could not do that anymore. And it got me into such distress uh, because I didn't have the, uh, the training, you know, or the mindset. And definitely I did not have the self-compassion that I've worked to develop since. And there was nobody else to give me compassion from outside to just say, this is okay. Everything changed. You are fantastic and you will figure it out you know, maybe do this, maybe, you know, like, let's try this, let's try that. It was just, what do you mean? You could do it and now you can do it. And now we're, you know, we hired you and you're not publishing as much as we, you know, you were publishing before you had kids. That, and, you know, just saying this, my heart starts racing, right? And so what I really want to do is, and, and Megan, why I, you know, stopped you was because I really appreciated what you said. This could become a resource not just for you as an academic writer, but for you as somebody training other academic writers. So I really envision this and, and you know, I'm working on this as, as a book project. Let me just show you where the book project is. Uh, here it is, <laughs> because process is messy. Here's the book project. It's all these folders with, you know, tons of drafts. Some of them are longhand. Some of them are, um, you know, printed out, etc. I am thinking about this as, as an alternative curriculum that needs to be developed to begin. Honestly, I don't think we've begun training academics as writers. I know I was not trained as a writer. I was trained as a global television scholar and as a communication, uh, film and media scholar. Um, cutting edge training, I'm grateful for, but what my professors were role modeling was, you know, let me just say this, during the time of my PhD, three assistant professors in my program were not tenured. <laughs> you know, spoiler alert, so wasn't I <laughs> when the time came. So not to blame them at all. Uh, you know, and one, two of these cases were appealed and received tenure. Uh, one person went and received tenure somewhere else and one person was married to another person. And you know, when the one of them uh, got that other job, that person got an instructor position. But why did that happen, right? So if I am being trained, if we are being trained by people who are being crushed by the circumstances of, or I want to call it the, the production condition, right? The conditions we have around producing scholarship, written products of our scholarship in academia is so horrible. It's so uh, unforgiving. It's so unsupportive. You know, uh, we can talk about all the different stages, right? But, you know, you, even if you manage to get yourself to submit something, you know, then it goes into the review and more horrible things can happen there. And, you know, you, you just got to, you know, I, I, so many of the people who trained me were traumatized writers themselves. I talked about last time about, you know, one of my advisors saying th something like, I never go back and read what I published. And that was the advice I was given, you know. That sounds horrible. It sounds disassociated, right? We disassociate when we are experiencing a violent trauma, right? We, we just leave our bodies. I mean, not to, to make light of, I will say this, I did work with people who had compl complex trauma and complex post-trauma from finishing their, let's say finishing their dissertation while a parent died or, you know, uh, while having children. So. I don't think it's a stretch to say that we're being trained by people who were traumatized by their work environment. And so what they role model for us, we end up internalizing and then we move it, uh, we, we pay it forward. So I really appreciated what you say, Megan, because this is what I really hope that the impact of this work, and this is why this is important for me to make available for free to the extent possible, because we can make the world a better place because the world needs our contribution. It needs your contribution, my friends who are here, those who I can see and those who I cannot. We need scientists, God damn it, it's 2020 and we know how much we need scientists. So if the world outside of academia is hostile to science uh, and then the world inside of academia is crushing the hearts and souls of scientists just because they have to write and they were never taught how to write, then my little mission here is to try to maybe, maybe create, you know, start something or, you know, join a movement to try to make this just 
a little bit more humane for us to survive our jobs because what we have to contribute is important. And when we are in, uh, in that traumatic or post-traumatic situation where we're not producing our best work because we are burnt out, we are drained, we are traumatized, we are persecuted, especially anybody that's of color, of a vagina, if I may, <laughs> you know, of any kind of a marginalized, yes, I like to see in case people were not listening now, yeah, everybody, I got everybody's attention, right? Um, of any kind of marginalized uh, identity, uh, we all know how that looks. We all know that a contemporary academic environment falls short of the ideal of inclusivity and of diversity and of supporting. And so, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm down from my soapbox. <laughs> so Megan, did you have any specific thing to share about a project you're, you're trying to write or like your writing life or anything more specific that you um, would want to workshop or? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, currently I'm probably like a lot of people, I've got a lot of different things on the go. I, well, one of the, things that I'm particularly interested in talking about a bit is um, part of working on my own process is not just for me but also for my my co-authors because I, I write a lot of stuff with co-authors right and so when you brought up the whole issue like constantly thinking I'm not writing I'm not writing it takes over every facet of your life and I always think about that as as it's not just me thinking I'm not writing for my per, for myself for myself I'm not writing and it's holding up others. And so like right now I've got two articles, co-authored articles that are, are stuck and they're stuck because they're stuck with me right now. And one of the big problems I have is that I perhaps going back to that being told, well, treat it like a nine to five job and come back with a final product is that I always look for big chunks of time to work and I increasingly don't have big chunks of time. And so on the days like I would like to develop some kind of habits that allow me to work on my writing every every day if possible if only for a little while because I, I don't have those big chunks of time so I have to change something mentally that allows me to, to do that differently um, for myself and for my students and for my co-authors. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for a book here that uh, there's a, a whole bunch, two books, and I mentioned it last time, but uh, and again, Megan, you already took the class, so you're, it's all coming your way. Uh, but this is a great question. So first of all, yes, the, I think what you're, uh, this is a common thing that is shared uh, amongst a lot of academics. And definitely, I think for, for, for COVID times, I think this is going to be really relevant. So thank you for, for this question. Uh, learning how to not rely on this endless time. And this is also what I think feeds the idea that I'll write in the summer or I'll write over the break, right? So that's part of what's, uh, and, and, and this is not an all or nothing. You can have more intensive times when you can do more of, of, of one type of activity that's involved with writing. So here's a couple of things I wanna say here. Not all the stages of writing is this finger flapping on keyboard. This is why I hate so much the book by Daniel De Silva, I think that's called How to Write a Lot. <laughs> I hate that guy so much. I mean, I'm sure he's a lovely person, but he's saying, well, writing is, is a behavior. It's a behavioral, he's a behavioral psychology. So, you know, it's flapping your fingers on a keyboard. No, writing is not flapping your key, because here, I'm flapping. Can you hear me? But I'm not writing. So this is bullshit. Writing is a creative, intellectual, emotional, spiritual, may I say, process. And it's a practice. And it's something that you need to learn how to be mindful about. And it's something that you know you, you, can, you need to constantly develop. And as I said before, it's not like, oh, okay, now I learned how to write. Uh, because life is not like that. I've learned how to write, and now everybody's at home, and I had to relearn how to write with everybody at home because I really need my solitude. So I, I can talk more about what I did with that. So I, 
my ear perked when you said, because so many times people are telling me the answer to their issue. Like, you told me what your problem was. You said, you already know that you need to find a way to work in smaller chunks of time. So you already know the answer, right? Um, and honestly, most of the work I do with people is legitimizing your own hunches. Like, I feel like everybody knows what the little tiny next step or the little tiny next intervention that's useful for them can be. Um, and so there's so much noise around the normative advice, back to what I said before about the normative advice. We tend to let people overtake us, especially authority figures who are, you know, we're trying to prove to them that we are worthy. And the psychology is, is, of this is that we go and if the, it's like, tell me professor, you know, and, and people do this with you too, right? So tell me how to be worthy, go and work from nine to five. If that is not A, the reality of your life and B, what really supports your writing, I can never write from nine to five. I'm a very prolific writer. I write if, in chunks of 45 minutes. I think and read in chunks of two hours. So if, you know, but these are different assignments. Writing is not just this. Writing is taking a walk and incubating an idea. Writing for me sometimes is allowing myself to do a puzzle and just let my left brain be uh, visually engaged in this while my right brain process, processes an epiphany. Writing, you know, especially for academic writers where it needs to be researched. Sometimes it, for me, it is to watch a whole season of uh, Israeli television. I'm an Israeli television scholar. That counts, right? So writing looks very, very different on its different stages in the, you know, uh, in the different projects, etc. So what I encourage people to do is become a mindful and be confident in owning and taking the power back um, in terms of what you know who who can tell you how to write who can un, uh, develop your writing process and practice only you i mean i can help by creating the space that would invite you to, to think about these things um but you know, I don't need to even do a show of hands. Did anybody ever in their academic training received any kind of information that's similar to what I'm saying right now? And if so, fantastic. Probably maybe people in creative writing workshops. Maybe. Because I've taken some of these and I've had some, you know, novelists and people like that come in and say, just sit there and just do it and treat it like a nine to five. And if you don't do it, then you're not serious and da 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 da. And you know, like, um, it's, it's just this endless cycle that reproduces itself. So again, uh, back to what you said, this book is fantastic, uh, this one, Around the Writer's Block. Around the Writer's Block by Roseanne Bain, B-A-N-E. And here's Roseanne Bain. And she's a wonderful author. Um, I love reading the subtitle for this book because it describes, it's my calling card. Uh, using brain science to solve writer's resistance, including, and here's the list, writer's block, procrastination, paralysis, perfectionism, postponing, distractions, self-sabotage, excessive criticism, overscheduling, and endlessly delaying your writing. I love that because I'm like, how did you know? Um, right? And so she talks about the power of 15 minutes. So she has a whole workbook. Um, and, but here's the deal. It's not just 15, it's not just the, uh, what you call it, um, you know, that app that you put on for 15 minutes, cause it's more than that, right? I, I forget what it's called. So that's, that's a good part of it, but she talks, she distinguishes and we spend a whole class, you know, going through her, uh, system between three type of chunks of time that you need to schedule for 15 minutes each and one and the main distinction that I love is between process time and product time so again Roseanne Ben talks about process time product time and self-care time and all three needs to be scheduled so I do want to talk about the process versus product um so process what I told you before about like doing a puzzle or for me you know when I when I first come to my desk, I would sit there and I'm allowed to doodle or, you know, just do, do my to-do list. So here's a list that I did this morning about the structure of the class. But you can see, I didn't say, I will sit at my desk and eat my first coffee and I will write, <laughs> you know, that, that voice. I sent that woman, I don't want to call her bad words right now, that part of me 
I sent her years ago, I sent her to Mexico to sit on a beach and drink margaritas because she was a really bad manager and she was stressing me the fuck out. So I had a whole, and this comes from, by the way, this, these kind of exercises are in this fantastic book, The uh, On Being Stuck uh, by Lauren Herring, tapping into the creative power of writer's block. Uh, so she she has these um, interventions where you create several characters inside, like your writer, your perfectionist, your project. You can write to your book that you're stuck on. You can write to your inner writer, inner child, all sorts of things, and you put them in conversation with each other. So my writing practice now is that I come to my desk. I know, you know, I no longer even do three times a week I'm gonna do twice because it's just, now it happens on its own. Let me turn my computer around a little to just show you my writing space. It became this beautiful, I was somebody that never, you know, didn't think they can draw or whatever. Um, I started doing a lot of this, like these uh, artistic things, you know? Now, the beauty of it is that it doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't need to be anything because it's just for me, just for fun. Um, this is one example. I know some people who, uh, this, so this is an example for process time. So I'm allowed to come in, listen to music or to some lecture from something that's interesting to me or a, a, a blog or a podcast or whatever and doodle. Back when I was a harried blocked academic writer, a lot of the time I would come to the coffee shop to try to do my work and I would end up uh, doodling and listening to music, but I would also spend the time feeling guilty. So I was doing the process time, I wasn't getting the benefit of the process time because I was beating myself up about uh, doing process time. So 15 minutes each of process time versus product time. So let's talk about what's product time. So process time is time where you're in your, um, you know, I do it like that, it's like in my work, but it could be not in your workspace. But I think for me, this created a ritual that's more gentle and more fun. And I'm immersing myself in a creative bath. Repeat that for yourself. Immerse yourself in a creative bath. Uh, thank you for uh, participating. So I see that you have to leave the meeting. Uh, thank you. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to uh, DM me on uh, Facebook or, or email me. Thank you for joining today. So, you know, immersing yourself in a creative bath uh, gives you permission to tap into, in a not structure, it's not like also, no, I'm going to immerse myself in a creative bath, so I better finish that article later. No, 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 right? You gotta just let go. We grasp and we need to let go. And so I created this ritual, but according to, and again, this, by the way, I've never worked in a regimented way with what Roseanne Ben is saying, 15 this, 15 this, 15 that, but I, and for some people, I'm sure it's great and they can work with the workbook and, and, and set the goals. And like, you know, if you're that person, you know, if you respond well to like really uh, regi not regimented because she's not regimented, but like really well structured, something that somebody else gave you and you want to try. And that can be fantastic to you. I kind of take a little bit of what is in these different books and I meld them through into my process in a way that works for me and what I do with clients and students is exact, the exact same thing. I give you a wealth. I immerse you in a creative bath of ideas and interventions and practices. Um, and then, but we go through the different areas that I identified are the most common pitfalls for academic writers. And it begins with this well-designed for you imposter syndrome, our environment, it's by design, you know, it's trying to make us you know, well, by design, not, not, I don't know how conscious it is. I mean, I talk often about, you know, when I was a faculty and we would come to the first meeting, faculty meeting of the year, who loves faculty meetings? No one. All right. And then every year <laughs> they would start by telling us that uh, they got word from the upper echelons of the university that basically we're awful. You guys are not doing enough research. You're not getting enough grants. You're not, and, and the list just went on and on. It's like a bad conversation with your boyfriend. Let me tell you all the things that you're not doing for me, right? And I remember even as like a first year assistant professor in the program looking around, I'm like, okay, you guys just hired me. And I know that this guy just published this book and this woman just, you know, 
uh, organize this international conference and this, you know, and I'm looking around the room and instead of them, you know, I thought everybody would, would be like, are you kidding me? We are working hard. Everybody was like, oh yes. Oh, we're so sorry. Yes, we don't do enough. You know, oh no, how do we do more? And I just, I remember early on, well, obviously, <laughs> you know, I'm a rebel. I was like, you all are tripping, you know, like, why are you accepting this situation where you're constantly being told it's not enough? Um, again, as the years went by, I saw how much by design it is because, I mean, it pays off for the university to just, you know, constantly telling you that the bar is higher and you need to do more, you know, just even in the tenure trajectory, you know, people that came up before me needed to have a final book contract or got tenured even without the final book contract, just booking, you know, I had the final book contract and it wasn't enough, right? It's always like they keep raising the bar and it's creating this environment of, of scarcity of you're not enough and we don't have enough and everybody's competing now. And again, this is a segue, but I'm just trying to show you all the areas that we're talking about. This is also bringing me to talk about competition and how awful competition is for creativity. So I don't know, you know, I don't know if you guys know the research, but this is researched, backed up by data. Um, you know, what I'm going to tell you. When the task that you are giving a group of research participants is mechanical, then competition can get them to do if it's stuffing more envelopes right if you promise more money to those who would do it faster no problem but if you take the same group and you give them a creative assignment they need to build something together and if you pick them into a competition between the groups all the groups do worse than in the other environment and actually this uh, um, experiment was uh, recreated in a netflix reality show called uh, 100 humans uh, so I recommend that you go and watch it. They did that. They, they, they divided a, a group of, you know, uh, two groups of humans into uh, groups of four or something like that. And in one room, so 15, 15, in one room, they told them they were all competing and only the ones who would build the, the tallest thing from marshmallow and bagels or, whatever, or pretzels, right? Um, that, that only one group would be rewarded and the others punished. And the other group, they just told them, just have fun, enjoy yourself. And in the just have fun, enjoy yourself. I mean, it doesn't take a research uh, and creativity uh, scientist to know that overall, everybody did better in the group that wasn't competing. Back to the faculty meeting that's telling you you're all shit, or even just the graduate seminar where the professor is pitting everybody against each other competitively, you know? In a graduate seminar, for example, you know, I was doing Israeli television and somebody next to me was doing French film and somebody else was doing Bollywood. Why are we competing? <laughs> what are we competing about? We are all creating new knowledge. Why not foster an environment of creativity and just compassionate support? All right, you guys are getting where I'm going with this. Anybody else has, uh, want to get some, hey guys, free coaching. Let us know what's going on and see if I can catch what you're doing to yourself. I really re recommend trying to, you know, I, I charge $500 an hour for this, <laughs> you know, for my corporate or university clients. So does anybody want to share a little bit of what they have going, what's going on with this uh, semester during COVID time? Uh, yes. Hi. Hi. Yeah, um, my name is Kothar. Hi, uh, Kothar. And, um, yeah, hi. I'm a scientist. I'm a junior scientist here in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and I work on HIV research. So lately I've been working on writing grants, which is like the first time I'm writing a grant, a big grant, like for asking for like a very good chunk of money. And English is not my first uh, language, so it's a little bit hard for me to write down. And I have these collaborators there are four collaborators. They're all like senior scientists. They're like big names in my field. And I'm just this tiny <laughs> junior scientist with them. So it's already hard for me to write wherever I need to write. <clears throat> and the feedback for them, it's always it's just like <laughs> crushing down everything I'm writing. <laughs> and it's already hard enough. I'm blocked all the time. It takes me like I don't know, a whole day to write a paragraph, for example, <laughs> something like that. So 
uh, I already missed my first grant submission, which was in August. And it was already like pretty hard because um, I missed my first, uh, my baby's first year like uh, birthday because I was like just writing the whole day, had my meeting in the afternoon. Um, I spent like two hours with her that day and that whole time I was just thinking, oh, I need to go back. I need to keep writing. Oh my God, I have the meeting. I need to go. So I didn't enjoy those two hours. So that actually killed me and I feel really bad about it. I will never forget myself for missing her day. And at the end, I missed my deadline anyway. It's like, <laughs> that was like for nothing. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm, I'm saying, wow, wow, wow. I'm muted, but I'm going, wow, 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 wow here. So first of all, let me just name for you. This is really hard, okay? This is not, and, and so I'm just like, you are giving me all, you're like the uh, ideal client type. Of, like you're bringing together a lot of the things. So you didn't even say to begin with, I am a mother, I have a baby, right? So I would start with that. You see what I'm saying? It's like, you are in the thick of it. This is the perfect storm. You are brave and wonderful and great for getting up every morning and facing everything that you have. Cause you know, is this your first baby? Yeah. So, so no is, sleep. <laughs> no, and so listen, I gotta tell you, hey, I am sending love and light your way to hold you in compassion because this is a rough, this is a time of transition. You are being called upon to step up as a new parent. You're teaching yourself how to be a parent, you know, I hear the guilt, you know, they say in, uh, uh, I, my friend in Israel used to say, they take out the placenta and they put in guilt, you know? Yeah. So mother, I say mother's nude, middle name is guilt, all right? So just for that, for having to do, and listen, we're in the United States of America, we have zero support for parents and especially, you know, mothers, like there's just, and this is before COVID, right? And even before yeah. Trump. So, I mean, we can talk to Yael, who's in Norway, which I, I'm sure it's going to be, it's hard, but there are so much more just support from the state, right? To support. So, you know, you are in the thick of it. This is hard. It doesn't get harder than what you just described to me. Because then let's bring back what you said early on. You are in the perfect environment for an imposter syndrome. And you're buying into it. Oh, little me, and they're so big. Let me tell you, these... These big people, A, I'm sure they have their own imposter syndrome. B, it sounds to me like they're not pulling their weight at all, and they're expecting you, the new mother of a newborn, to shoulder all the burden. So fuck them, excuse me. Um, <laughs> just, just, I don't, I'm, I don't work in academia anymore. I can say it, right? And it sounds like instead of getting you the support you need, because they hired you, so you are the right person for the job, you are qualified, you are worthy, you're bringing to the table what you need to bring to the table, but you're not being trained or supported or you know, fostered or encouraged. And, you, it's, and this is so typical. Again, not to say that they're like particularly horrible people, though I'm sure they could be. Um, it's, it's a lot of time by negligence, right? I have seen it so much and it's so interesting because, you know, I was teaching this class in, uh, and it was a lot of CDC people and a lot of people in CDC that were doing HIV public outreach kind of work. And one of them went there to actually help people like you that he was supervising. So there are different people that you, there was this guy, one guy that too, he took the class and he said, you know, I'm okay with, right. You know, I, and he was a really prolific. He said, I, I have a team of younger scientists. And I was just struck by how hard it is for them, especially for the new uh, young mothers, um, that they didn't know how to deal with everything they had and they were freaking out. And I wanted to teach myself about the academic writer's block so that I'm a better boss to them. So just so you know that some people can be out there that can have that mindset. But given that you are not in that environment, what I really want to do for you and what I want you to do for you is how can we get rid of some of the layers of the guilt, the feeling of inadequacy, uh, the panic, because, you know, it's like you're in quicksand, right? And when you're in quicksand, if you fight, you drown faster, right? But the hardest yeah. thing to do is what's the right thing to do, which is to, to try to just stretch and relax 
<laughs> but it's very hard. Now, the guilt with your daughter, I mean, you said the baby was a daughter? Yeah, she's a baby girl. But I, my first was a baby girl. So like, listen, I, my heart goes out to you. I will just tell you this, okay? We're not fucking this up. You are trying your best. Every mom does. You are out there in the world. You want to show her a role model of a woman that doesn't give up when it's hard, okay? And, you know, you, I'm assuming you, there is a support, a little bit of support system at least. You know, some people are sharing, you know, it's okay if she's learning also that a family or a community can be trusted and not just the one person, the mom from the 50s with the vacuum cleaner and the martinis waiting for her husband to come home because that's not our lives, okay? No. So you are doing good stuff for her by showing up for your career. And that doesn't mean that if, you know, I, when I was denied there and I decided to leave my academic career, that didn't take my worst either. So let me tell you this, if they take from you everything that was conferred upon you in terms of status, your degree, your fancy job, whatever, you will find out. And let me tell you, as somebody that went through that process, they cannot take from you your self-worth because that is innate in you. You have it. You got it. This is what got you so far. And this is what's going to get you through the loophole of the experience you're going through now, which is you're having it hard. This is hard. This is push coming to shove. This is the perfect storm. So I just want to encourage you. You are doing it. You don't understand how much and to what degree by persevering, even if you are feeling like you're failing, you're winning. I, I promise you. Okay, now <laughs> with that, <laughs> it, it's true, I, I feel for you. I really feel for you because I've been there and I've done that. I started a tender truck job, you know, with a newborn. I didn't get an adjustment for the newborn. So I just, you know, she was three months old, running with the breast pump to orientation, flying back to Texas from Georgia to defend. So I, I know, I, I, you are not sleeping. And it's not like they're asking you to do stuff you've done before. You're teaching yourself how to write this brand new thing. This is hard. Now think about it. If your child, when she's older and she comes back from school and maybe she's like seven and she's having a hard time with her assignment, you know, would you tell her, oh, you're, you know, you're just failing right now. Oh my God, what are, you're just, you must be lazy and not motivated. You know, I bet you're telling yourself things like that. I bet you are being hard on yourself on top, right? So here's what I always say. Um, and I will say to you, please understand the part of you that creates, that writes, is a very young, vulnerable part. If you are angry at that part and all you give her, your inner child, is anger, criticism, judgment, harsh, critique. Why can't you do all of this, right? It's like you yourself forget the context that you laid out for us, right? When, you, when it's time for you to look in the mirror and say, oh, I'm not, you know. So what could you do for your inner child if you thought about the part of you that writes as the inner child and not as the adult that you're expecting all these things of? Because you have a child inside that's the inner writer, and that child is struggling right now. She's being asked to perform in a very difficult set of circumstances, and her mother is angry at her. This is you, <laughs> you know, saying to her, if you can't pull me through, then you're going to fail me, and I will not survive because you, writer, are fucking it up. So yeah. when you are in that, right, is this resonating? Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. So, you know, if you do this to yourself, so when I work with clients and they're in that spot that you are, and I'm so glad you jumped on this call because this is exactly the work, right? Then the first step in the process is what I call the stop, drop, and roll. And, you know, this is what we say to children in the United States when we are training them um, uh, about fire safety, right? So I'm going to tell you this, you are on fire, but you're acting as if you're not on fire. You know, you are on fire. You need to stop, name it, know it, forgive yourself because any other friend you had that would tell you, I have a, a newborn, I have this new fancy job. These people are like intimidating for me and I'm feeling like I'm fucking up. That if it's a good friend, that friend would not say, well, then why are you a fuck up? 
Yeah. Right. So be that friend to yourself. Be that friend that says, no, I am struggling because this is hard. This is hard and I am struggling and that's okay. Because that's going to take 90% of the burnout because you are making this harder for yourself by being mad at yourself for having a normal response for abnormal circumstances. Or, you know, I don't know if it's abnormal, but like difficult circumstances. So instead of being your friend by saying to yourself, well, this sucks, this is hard, I don't get enough sleep, I'm teaching myself how to be a, a, a mother, I'm teaching myself how to write grants, my sense of my survivability in my career is, everything is all like, and I will tell you another thing that nobody told me and I wish somebody did, and so let me tell you this, you will be fine if this work goes to shit and burns in a spectacular Failure. I was denied tenure by a bunch of assholes. You think I am less worthy? I'm, I was no. worthy before they denied me tenure, and I was, I'm as worthy. I, they could not take my, my worth. Same thing with the success. I'll give you the other side. A book I worked on received the best award, uh, a best edited collection award by the leading organization in my field. The year before, Everybody in my department, I was a newly hired PhD, uh, PhD right, with a newborn. And I, the, the discourse around me was, she only has this collection. Right? I had a bunch of articles as well, but like, right, it's not a book, it's just a collection. And I kept telling them, but the collection is really good. And they were like, yeah, no, no. When it won the award, all of a sudden I was the star. And I said, but God damn it, he wouldn't have won the award if it wasn't good, right? It was good before it won the award. And the award, you know, it's politics and it's what was had in this year. And um, I almost didn't get it because they ended up splitting it between my book and a book. It was like in the film and media. So the film people wanted their book and the media people wanted their book. And, and usually they don't split the award, but they gave one, right, to me. And so it could have not won the award. So I could have remained with the discourse that I'm some fuck up that only has a, a, an edited collection. But then the edited collection won the award. So what I'm trying to demonstrate with all of this is if you're awarded and celebrated or if you're not awarded and celebrated your inner worth does not depend on this you need okay that's too normative i recommend <laughs> not you need what i really think can help is reminding yourself your own values what do okay. you value right what do you value do you value the work you're doing <laughs> if you value the work you're doing then you can trust that in the calmness that can come by you accepting that this is hard, you can start making progress by making small manageable steps. First off, you step back away from the panic, back away from the self-admonishment, back away from you being your own worst enemy in that sense, right? And then stepping forward towards making small interventions that can help you rebuild and develop a new writing practice that would support you through still doing your work, although you're negotiating a really big life change, right? You can't expect of yourself to be performing. You can, you can expect of yourself to be as excellent, but not through the same pro process that you had before yeah. you had the child. You went through pregnancy and childbirth, I'm assuming. It doesn't have to be, but even if you didn't, it is. Porn is enough, right? But if you also had that physical, come on, give yourself a break. You know, I think we, we deserve three years off for each baby if we actually made it in our bodies. Hey, go ahead. No, I was saying I wish. I wish we had three years for each baby. <laughs> that would be great, right? But especially the first, right? I mean... It's such, and so I have a whole chapter in my book about transitions, uh, and it's kind of similar. It's about my friend, I will not name the friend, calling me. Um, similar kind of thing, right? You know, she finished her uh, degree in a different continent. Her husband is in a different continent. She is a single parent because the husband is in a different continent, two academics. Single parent of two children, teaches five uh, courses a semester, and when she calls me, what she says is, it's been a year and I've not made my dissertation into a book project yet. And I'm like, okay, let's see what you did do over the year. You moved across from Europe back to Israel. <laughs> She's Israeli, okay? You've been 
a single parent, she doesn't have supporter, you are supporting pain for the three ring circus. You're doing all of these things. She was also doing activism and pro bono work as a, you know, just tons of things. But the narrative she had about it is, I'm not doing this. I didn't do that. And why? And why am I such a fuck up? And why, you know, why can't I have discipline? And I was like, you are highly disciplined, right? So it's that moment. What I really want you to try to take away from this is first we come down and then we think our way out of or feel even better, feel our way out of this, because you really just, um, we need to just, uh, you know the, the Arabic word, for sulha? Like when you, you know, you do, you bring together like the feuding tribes, and you, first of all, you know, you just have a party and everybody come together and try to just come down, and then you start negotiating terms for bringing together the uh, yeah. fighting tribes. You need to do a sulha, and you need to forgive yourself for whatever it is that the part of you that's so self-critical believes that you fucked up on because <laughs> you didn't you just had a child you're allowed <laughs> you know i'll tell you another thing as a um we are so prone to perfectionism when you become a mom and you're an academic you're trying to be a perfect mom and a perfect academic this is not it's it's not that's not a thing okay you don't need to be perfect. You just you need to be um, doing your best every day, okay? And sometimes it's going to be more about the child and sometimes it's going to be more about the work and both are okay. And when you kind of, again, take your power back to, I want to, everybody, here's a tree hugging mantra. You stand on the ground floor of your house or even on the ground best to ground yourself and you just... Think about all the things that freak you out and you do this and you say, I'm taking my power back to me. I'm taking my power back to me from my colleagues who are making me feel insecure. I'm taking my power back to me from my guilt about my uh, mothering, though I know I try my dumbness. I'm taking my power back to me from, I don't know, my mother-in-law. You see what I'm saying. You, you feel the yep. blanks for you. Because what, by, you know, buying into the hype, you are actually giving your power away to those negative thoughts. And no wonder you can't be your best writer in those circumstances. Because when you come, I bet when you come to your desk, you're already at heart rate and freaked out and anxious, right? So how do I know that? Because this is very common. And so those, those are the, uh, the, the ingredients of a writing block. You have it, but you, you know, People might think that I paid you to jump on this call. <laughs> because <laughs> you are really presenting us with the classical uh, textbook case. Well, and it's good to know that I'm not the only one. It's not me. I'm not the problem. <laughs> absolutely not. And I can tell you, you know, I think 90% of my, of my clients are first time moms or, you know, not for, like, you know, moms of very young children who are coming out of grad school or they're on their first uh, couple of years of a job or it's, it's really a hard time. It's also a really, I mean, believe it or not, you will look back and um, these are also the good old days. You know, you can't appreciate it now, but it is. Um, it goes by really fast, but it's really precious. And I hear what you were saying. You said, I value my time with my child. So I would really invite you not to, not to then turn around and be mean to yourself about some of the sacrifices that you have to make in your career. They shouldn't be long-term is what I'm saying. I mean, sometimes, and, and if the environment around you is going to punish you for wanting to do the right thing for your baby, then, you know, I would say maybe there's a better environment for you to yeah. still, you know, be able to do all the things you want to do without feeling guilty about wanting to be there for your, for your child and vice versa. Your child, this is, life is long. I now have a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old. Let me tell you, whatever one afternoon felt like when I couldn't be there for their birthday at school, that does not determine whether or not they feel loved, they feel seen, they feel appreciated and they have a mom that's a role model for somebody that's persevering when it's hard. You know what I mean? So yeah. just be, go easy on yourself. No, no. to 
notice the things that you're doing right because I'm sure you're doing a lot of things right. And also, how can we learn if we don't make mistakes? So allow yourself your mistakes. Right? I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot. I feel passionate about helping you because I so know where you are. I just want you, and here's another thing I can tell you. Step one for your recovery, take a fucking vacation. You deserve it. Pamper yourself, take some time off, uh, whatever that looks like for you. You know, if you can get an hour alone or you can go to a spa or whatever, well, COVID, but you know what I mean? Like, take some time to just celebrate yourself, to tell yourself, you know what? This is hard, but I'm not giving up and I'm trying to make this work. And even if you have to then shift uh, courses, that's also a lot of work, you know what I mean? Even to, to, to yeah. figure out if this is not working. And stop insulting yourself. I can see that you're almost gearing up and I will tell you why that is. The person that's insulting you, because you're with an insult, it's you. You're insulting you. Don't do that. I don't need to, to get into the details to know how wonderful you are because you got a job. Like nobody gets jobs anymore. You know what I mean? Like, so stabilize the storm inside that goes, oh, you can't do anything right and you're messing this up and this is all awful. Remind yourself all the many things I'm sure that you've achieved. And even with that, remind yourself that your worth does not reside in achieving any of these things. Right? No, Again, I remember my thing with the award. I could have gotten the award, but I would hopefully be able to be as proud of the book that I produced if it won the award and if it didn't win the award. Right? Yeah. Thoughts or did I kill you? <laughs> You're like crazy. No, no, no. Curl up in a ball and die. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, sometimes we need to hear these things from other people, from strangers sometimes, just like it's helpful. So. Thank you. Uh, I see my job is to be, uh, you know, a, a stranger of consequence. That that's perfect <laughs> for me. But yeah, let me know. I would be, and and by the way, I'll be happy to work with you. And if you need, uh, I would ha be happy to also give you a, a fellowship if if that's what would stand in the way, or you know, a scholarship, because you are the ideal person. Because you know, I'm doing this work, ladies and probably all ladies. I don't I don't know who else is like ladies and maybe gentlemen. I'm doing this work because I was this person. I was this person and nobody helped <laughs> and I was like, ah, <laughs> and so I really, and, and what I'm, the reason I'm saying this is like, take this and do this for others in your life as well. Uh, Mara, you, you uh, are showing us your beautiful face. So I'm assuming you want to jump in. Yeah, sorry. I, I, sorry, I missed the first half and uh, I have bad internet connection. So sometimes I have to turn the, the video off. But, no need um, to apologize. Thank you for, for all this really good advice. Um, I, I have a strange uh, case, which is that I basically I started my PhD uh, in 2005, and I was really good the first few years, you know, finished my exams, finished my dissertation proposal, but then I just completely burned out. And um, when I had to start <laughs> writing my dissertation, and then, um, and then, you know, I also was depressed and I uh, came back to my home country. And yeah, uh, I was like, I'm stopping you because I would, I would, if I would work with you as a coach, right? What I would then slow you down about when you say, well, and then I started burning out. I would, I bet you there's a lot for this, right? What, what was going on? I'm, I'm sure, and I'm not saying share with the world, but right. But this is, we tend to just like uh, rush through saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah the bad stuff, but it's important to name, right? So I'm sure there was a lot that created the transition that, you know, there was a transition, I'm sure, over there between you doing it and like a kid in a candy store enjoying your trajectory and the block, right? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is that um, I now realize that I'm not really good at working in an isolated <laughs> environment so you know the first few years of course you're like taking classes you're in mm. seminars you're discussing with your peers and then everyone kind of just goes uh their own way and and my program was very small like we were only a cohort of four people so it just um it it yeah I think I, I just became really isolated um that's a big one and then so I you know I had I'm just saying good good uh job naming this because again this could be a transition and um a lot of times between graduate school and writing your dissertation or even you know graduate school even if you know and then your job 
isolation is such a big part of what happens. Like we are cut off from a natural feedback loop where we have others around us that, you know, I, I even, I think I, I talked about this in other places where I imagined that if I'm hired in a department and there's all these colleagues who are in my field, there's gonna be some vibrant discussion going on and that was not the case. It was like actually a very hostile, toxic environment, right? So you can, right? So, it's, right. so yeah, so good, good job naming that. So you discovered that when you are deprived of this cocoon of the community that's supporting you and now you're just cut off and you're supposed to somehow support yourself through it, right? So yeah. say more a little bit about what happened then. So then, I mean, then, you know, I, I actually, I started working outside of academia um, because, you know, it was, it was like, I ran out of funding. Uh, I had some visa problems. So I had to come back. Uh, and, and so I, in a way, I, I feel like I owe my, um, I, I, I was in a film studies program and now I work as a film curator for a film festival. So I, I feel like I owe my career to avoiding my dissertation in a way. <laughs> hey, you know, there, whatever works. So, wow, a couple of things here. So first of all, I mean, what's wrong with having a different career, right? It's, it's, it sounds like you're now doing something that you really like. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I have no reason really. Well, I have, I think that the, the problem is that um, I'm facing two pressures. One is if I don't finish my degree, I have to give back a grant that I got from my government for my degree. <laughs> oh. And, um, and you That's know, no and, fun. And, and I, I spent like, and, and I'm also having visa issues. I don't know if any of you have had to go through the US immigration system. Yes. <laughs> like, it is Absolutely. like the, yes. so, the US, so let me ask you this, I'm, I'm trying to clarify. So you, you're, you're, you are an international student on a J visa, basically? No, I was, a, I was on an F visa for a long time. Then um, I came back to Mexico, but I worked for a film festival in the US. So I was, I was getting like an H visa. And now, um, you know, I, I'm in the process of getting an O visa, but, uh, you know, basically definitely... what I'm trying, what I'm trying to dis discern is like, so you doing your academic work of finishing your dissertation got caught up in your survival in terms of your immigration status. That's very stressful, yeah. right? So this is a classic case as well, right? So, so many times, you know, it, it could be the same with a tenure track job or any kind of job of, or, you know, what uh, the grant writing job that was discussed earlier, like any kind of, when we transition from, this is something we're doing for our joy and passion because we love knowledge and we want to contribute. And then suddenly the structures academia have around that are there to support us, right? Okay, I'll give you a visa and you'll come and do, but it becomes a situation where, you know, the horse before the cart and the cart before the horse kind of situation. Like, are you trying to push the cart with the horses behind because the vehicle is no longer aligned with, I had passion to want to say this thing, but no, now you have to finish it or at least there's a narrative that could, this could be a very big block. If the narrative in your head becomes, now I have to do it, not because I want to do it, but I have to do it because of financial, economic reason. And I'll, let me say another thing as a question. Is there also something going on here, uh, which is a very bad kind of narrative, like the sunk cost narrative? You know what that is? It's like, I already put in, so yes, for same sure, mistake, sure. throwing good money after bad kind of thing. Well, I mean, it's mixed because, you know, I, I, I did a lot of research. I love my research. And I realized that the thing that I hate is this academic style of writing, because for me, it just, it takes my confidence away, you know? And, and in this, you know, in these years that I've been outside of academia, I've actually written a lot for catalogs. I've like worked on three book projects. Um, and, you know, so that makes me feel like, well, how come I can do this, but I cannot? You know, it's, it's, so it's the genre first of all, of you can do both. So let me just, let's rewrite that story. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing this fast because also because of time, but what I do with clients is like, we find the stories you tell, tell yourself. And when the story is a story that's, why can't I rewrite that story? You can, okay? So first of all, that's, you know, I'm not, you know, it's, it's not quick or easy, but you can rewrite the story. That's A. B, I hear you. You are saying, and, and this takes me back to the second point that I wanted to tell you early on, 
The second one I wanted to say early on, it's going to connect in a minute, you will see, is um, the goddamn timeline in academia. There, the academia can be really good at, oh, you're timed out. If you're not doing things in a certain, you know, even uh, me, because I was in a tenure track job and um, I had two babies, so I had two stoppages, right? So at some point, I was locked out of applying for some grants because either you already had tenure, if you're in that timeline or not. And I'm like, but, I'm, but my book is fantastic, you know, whatever. But they wouldn't even consider your application because of the timeline. So, so this can become a problem even more when you internalize the narrative of now you are somehow late. It starts mm -hmm. feeding your blog by saying, I fucked up because my life circumstances, you know, the whole like time from degree, time to degree, you know, all of that. So that's a big one that I'm naming for, because I'm sure a lot of people that will, are watching or will watch this later. When you start falling out, out of the rhythm that they created in this world for what needs to happen when, but you are a human being and you had a, a transition and there was a situation, and, you know, and then another thing, desires started percolating in terms of your creative desires that were not contained within the vehicle of writing the dissertation. So a couple of things about that. A, I hear you, I see you, it sucks, and it can be very debilitating. That's, that's just name it, right? So you're on fire, stop, drop, and move. B, you can write your dissertation in a way, maybe, that might facilitate turning the material into more popular products and not academic products. So that would be something that I would, again, as a coach, I would, or if you're in the class, I would definitely want to look at, can we find a different story where, okay, you, you, cause you just told me this, I do like my research. I am passionate about it, right? So maybe if we can realign and I suspect that you're going to be one of the people that gets off the call and you're unblocked and you're all good and you don't need me anymore. And that's fine. <laughs> all right. But it could be helpful. Right. But that's okay. But can we find a more, like you got to step back from the stories you have, you have re-examine the facts and see if you can fit them into a new narrative that says, I have an opportunity here to finish the degree. What do I need to do to finish this? But I can write it in a way that at least in my mind, I know it's going to become not a, um, a journal article or a monograph, but it can be a serious nonfiction or a series of blog posts, or maybe it's a project that's a documentary, a film, mm -hmm. who knows, right? But that's what I would totally invite you. So rewrite the story to where you're a survivor and you're a fighter and you're a creative person. Life gave you lemons and you're gonna make lemonade. And now it's just the question of seeing how? Because you see, you take your power back again and take your power back from academia, from their timeline, from all the noise and the bullshit, because you went to get the degree because you had a contribution, a voice inside that wanted the training so that you can express and give something. So they can take this from you. The only person that can take this from you is you, <laughs> if you believe. <laughs> and that's back to everybody that's spoken. Right? We can only let them win if we become complicit, right? The only person that can really take our self-worth from ourselves temporarily is us, if we buy into the story, right? So that's the, that's the preachy preachy in the class, <laughs> you guys, and again, no strings attached, we really operationalize that. How do you create a process that restores the, um, I will say it this way, and Yale, tell me if that, that uh, reflects your uh, experience of what happened in the class. We kind of re restore the natural order of things, and the natural order of things is, first, there's fantastic you with everything you want to do and give, and then you went and got a degree, or you're in the process of getting a degree, because it was an end to, uh, sorry, a means to an end. And then, you know, time lapse and things change, and you, or, you know, like some of us, things like, uh, we had a baby or we had to go back home or we had to, you know, or, you know, what, what you were describing, like all of a sudden you find yourself isolated and you kind of had to shift. Right. And, and it created this bottleneck of, Oh my God, the visa and the immigration and it's Trump. And so I can only imagine at least, at least I went through this 
during the Obama years. So, you know, although I will tell you by the time I naturalized last year, so I had to see the, the video from Trump for naturalization, but it happened in the, and get this, I was being denied tenure as I was naturalizing. So like my career kind of brought me the, the citizenship and then evaporated just as I got it. So maybe that's what my career was about, right? Uh, and about learning to do this, what I enjoy doing now. Okay, so life is long and takes many turns and not all of them are gonna be expected. And what can help you be resilient, and this is for, for everybody, right? What can help you be resilient is remembering to center on your own creative, juicy, wonderful flow, your voice, your contribution. And, you know, when we make it about, oh, what are they thinking? Or what consequences will come if I fuck it up and I'm not on time? Or this, or it's... Um, it induces a panic. And when we panic, the frontal cortex goes offline and the limbic system that's back there, that's our lizard brain, jumps back up and it hijacks. And this is another uh, really fantastic thing that in this book, she explains how that happens. What happens when you have a limbic fight or flight or freeze? It's, people forget the third one, fight, fight or, or freeze. And writer's block is in that freeze place, right? Um, Although we have, in the day when we talk about this book, we talk about flight behavior, fight behavior, and freeze behaviors for the writer's block. So for example, when I get blocked, I write a lot and that's a fight behavior, but I write in circles and it's going nowhere, right? Okay, so um, <clears throat> when we get panicked, so this is again for, for uh, how did, Kastar? Is that how you said your name? Like, Kastlau? Mine? Yes. Kastlau. Say again? Kalsar? Kalsar? I said Kalsar. right? All right, I will try. I, <laughs> nobody can say Sharon either, but I, and I'm also like hard of hearing. So, <laughs> but I really want to, you know, say that you too, right? So what happens is we, uh, you know, we just become very little inside. Okay, we believe, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, good. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was waving, but I think she had to go. So, you know, we build um, people from outside as all powerful. That's the imposter syndrome. You know, they're powerful. And so then we panic. And when we panic, we have a limbic system overdrive. And I keep showing you this book because I really think everybody should buy it. I think I'm responsible for uh, uptick in the sales of this book because I always mention it. And she talks about what happens. What happens is confusing when you panic because you think you're acting rationally. When your limbic system, which is designed to help you run away from tigers in the jungle, right? It's an older awareness and survival mechanism in us. When it's triggered, you're thinking that the frontal cortex is running the show. The frontal cortex is the area of your brain that's capable of abstract, creative, problem solving. That's the part we need online to write. That paragraph that you couldn't write, right, for, for a year, you know, if you can write a paragraph from August through to October, then that means you're in limbic system override. So this is what I said before. First we come down and then we can think. So, but this book is so good in describing what happens when we don't understand that this is happening. It's like your, um, your frontal cortex is like a child that's sitting next to their parent who's driving, but the child has a toy wheel and they think they're driving. <laughs> So your frontal cortex thinks it's driving, but the limbic system just went like, stop, freeze, or fight, or avoid. And this is what's really running the show. And your frontal cortex is not aware that it's no longer in the driver's seat. So this, when you're blocked, when you have a real writer's block, this, it became a chronic situation. You are stuck on the limbic system. Adrenaline is destroying your body. You can become very sick, you know, heart disease, cancer, whatever, hormonal imbalance. It's just, it's, and especially if you combine it with other things like having a baby. Uh, I know because I was there, right? It's just, you become so vulnerable physically and you start getting ill and, and stressed and chronically. So when you are in that space, there needs to be a process of intervention where you first realize what's going on 
and you know you stop fighting the quicksand and you try to just relax enough to where you can come up with a plan that can get you baby steps and get you out of the wood and i'll throw in another um fantastic metaphor which i think is also in this book in the loren herring and she talks about what do you do when you're driving and there's a fog right and you find the yellow line at the side of the road and you just look at the yellow line right so basically if you are in a limbic override and you are everything is confusing you're in chaos it's confusion and disorder, right? And you need to try to find what the yellow line is. What can you follow that you can look at that's reliable? And you know, my uh, advice on that is that that's the inside. That's the inside voice that is the calm eye of the storm because inside there's a part of you that knows. So just like I said before, you can talk to your child self that's um, vulnerable and creative and you know not of this world and very you know you can also here's I'm giving all the tricks today you can always also write a letter or invite your older self you know the one that saw you through the one that already knows how you made it out of this pickle you know and you can write a letter from your older self I mean it very literally during process time sit there and journal and tap into future self, child self. You know, it could be, you, you know, your, uh, somebody else like your grandma. I, I would have really long conversations with my uh, dead grandma, <laughs> who I just, you know, feel is around. You know what I mean? Um, and because she would always tell me, and I hear her loud and clear, that my inner worth does not depend, that I'm wonderful and I'm great and I'm smart. And even if I feel stupid and inadequate and a fuck up, she was somebody that I could invoke that would hug me and tell me what I needed to hear. But then later I started really just invoking the idea of what if, basically I was calling present me, Sharon of 2020 to help Sharon of 2015, <laughs> you know? So I didn't know that by 2020, I'm already gonna have all the answers. So yay me. Um, but by doing these like tree hugging crazy things that most academics would feel very weird about, uh, all of those interventions are from the creative writing world and the coaching world and the creativity world. They are absolutely practical, rational, research-driven interventions that can help. Questions, because I'm like just going all woo-woo here. <laughs> Does that help, Mara? So Yeah, thank you. So some can you so what's resonating if you want to say some more so i i mean definitely the limbic system overdrive and the um paralysis <laughs> panic in this paralysis because um because i notice it when i have to write something with someone else like a collaboration it's really fun you know i feel zero expectations i just throw whatever out there and you know it's like this step by step and the writing gets done as opposed to when I'm trying to write my dissertation where I feel like I need to have a perfectly designed argument, perfect structure, perfectly, you know, uh, oh, yes, through my before I start writing. And then, you know, then I can't because then, because I, you know, it's like in a way writing is thinking, but I cannot. Absolutely. So you're I'm hitting on another big one, which is, you know, we cannot bring anything to perfection if we're not willing to write the, the really shitty first draft. And this is another thing that we work on a lot in, in, in my class and I work with clients. It's like, how do you release, um, you know, I, I always read this quote from Julia Cameron, it's above my workspace, so let me read this. She says, most of us are really willing only to write well, and this is why the act of writing strains us so. We are trying to do two jobs at once, to communicate to people and to in, impress them at the same time so you know what i always invite people to do is communicate first you know because once you get it out you have something that you can a see yourself and improve yourself b you can send it to somebody else so another thing that you were hitting on that community thing that working with other people so important but can also be by the way for some people the collaboration can can bring the imposters in. if you're collaborating with months with creative monsters right it could be bad um but if you know for yourself 
that collaboration is really useful for you, then I would encourage you to be creative of, about finding that community. You know, maybe you go online to some of the groups that have, you know, people doing a uh, dissertation and that, you know, you try to organize a writing group where, you know, of course, maybe you take a class where we do this and it's a community that, that's created in the class. Maybe you find one friend that you know from before that's in your area, you know, um, but keep trying to find a way if you know what it is that you need. And that's the other thing I want to tell everybody. You know what you need. If you uh, regularly show up, you do a, an hour a week where you're journaling about how you're feeling about your writing, what is going on in your writing. You're not trying to write the thing, but you're trying, that's part of process time, right? You try to understand, or you're not even, you don't try too hard. You just sit there and you write. So this is, um, I always, uh, let me quickly uh, explain what morning pages are. I buy these blank, this, I buy these in carts of 40 from the dollar store, like completely blank pages. You sit, you know, the morning pages is from Julia Cameron. Uh, she has the right to write and she also has The Artist Way. This is The Right to Write. It's a fantastic book. She's a creativity teacher, very famous. She's very famous for this book, The Artist Way. I have the complete Artist Way. This one is more like a 12-step program. She also battled alcoholism, so she modeled her uh, re creative recovery over, you know, rehab. So that's great. Um, but she talks about doing morning pages every morning, three pages of completely free flow. The only rule is you can't stop. You got to write until you have three pages. I really recommend it, but I will say this. It doesn't have to be in the morning. You know, it doesn't have to be three pages. Make it work for you, but do a regular situation where you just dump. So then you're not trying to get the outcome of the mindfulness, but you're writing your way into mindfulness. So let me say another thing about this. So this is like, we're gonna go buckle up. We're going woo-woo. What I've learned doing morning pages, doing journaling, doing those meditations, the written meditations, etc., is that you can dig a tunnel underneath your life and escape pretty horrible circumstances with your writing, right? Your writing is that little spoon that you made into something to break out of prison and you dig very slowly that's what i did you know so while i consciously was trying to get tenure by doing all of this work i was unconsciously digging a tunnel that freed me from that career that for me stopped working um and now i have my own business and I'm doing this and and you know and, and writing whatever i want to write etc etc and i also write my scholarship but less so I'm not, never saying never, you know, I do have a book under contract that the publisher will not let me get out of contract and they do want my scholarship. So who knows, but I'm writing memoir and I'm writing um, this as a self-help book, et cetera, et cetera. But I write regularly and I write joyfully and I teach, which is what I wanted to do in academia. So I, yeah, you see, I teach, I work with students. I do everything that I wanted to do. The one thing I'm not doing is trying to prove my worth by the prestigious position of my job or you know the positioning of my journal articles in the etc 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 the, the, the work i did for, to get tenure continues to come out in the best journals of my you know what i mean but now it doesn't mean as much to me as it did before all right so you guys are getting what kind of tricks i have uh to make academic writers um stop being so horrible to themselves and start finding that compassionate, and again, that little digging a tunnel underneath your bad habits that you bring into the writing, the self hell, you know, you're just, you're creating a hell for it. And it's not your fault. This is not, you know, it's not like to replace, now be angry at yourself also for doing this. You are being set up by an environment that's unforgiving. And, you know, I'm not gonna try to share this PowerPoint again because clearly that didn't go well, but definitely that's gonna be a part of, uh, the presentation in the class. All right, at this point, anybody else wants to jump in? I probably have uh, time for one more if anybody wants to, to take advantage. And if not, I'm going to say a couple of things about the class. Again, if there's interest, let me see if there's people in the chat, except for people saying I need to be going, etc. cetera. Uh, I'd like to hear more about the class, join late time press, Okay, good. So somebody that had to leave asked that, so that's good because that's what I want to talk about. So um, 
I want to talk about the class. So here, let me see if I can share the syllabus of the class. Oh, uh, Anoop, is this how you say your name? Yes, I mean, thank you so much. So wonderful. I feel a part of this so much. You know, I mean, all my heart and soul. I mean, this is oh, so much. Good. <laughs> good yeah. for representing the, you know, the, the gentleman here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I, I'm, I'm very fluid. I mean, I'm, I'm fluid as gender is. <laughs> there you go. So, good. Uh, well, there you are. That, that's why you fit, you fit right in the, the, the tree hugging academic. That's a whole other yes. identity that you can flow into. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> right. Um, I'm currently a PhD scholar at a university and I have just joined are in, actually. It's are you in, in the, my, where are you located in the world? I'm, I'm in India. That's India, it. yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's my second year. I mean, the coursework is going on and uh, after this I have my oral examinations and all of that. So, um, so like Mara said, uh, you know, about the cohort thing, even we have a small uh, group of people here, just five of them. And initially it was all good. And I was like trying my best to be a part of it and trying my best to be uh, like them, do things like them, uh, you know, be with them all the time. But then later on, I realized that I'm a bit different. And when I started just being my own self, I felt that I am not being accepted in that group and that I was also pressuring myself, punishing myself sometimes to just be there in that group. And, uh, and I didn't really feel that academic atmosphere to be very uh, supportive, you know, uh, to those uh, who are different, who, who have a world of their own, probably who want to stay out of the crowd, who, who probably have their own things to do. And, uh, and, and and that is what uh, sort of affected my work too, because I was not being able to write. But then later on, I realized that being on your own is also good and that you could always meet other people and uh, that you could have other things to talk about, probably not with the department members all the time, but maybe <laughs> with other people, you know, just like basic things or whatever. I mean, that uh, comes to you. Uh, but even then, I, I do feel that I'm somebody who doesn't get this kind of a space uh, where, you know, you can just talk about your writing process. You can be yourself in a way that is so visceral and so active and so yourself. And many a times I feel that I have to be on guard because uh, sometimes people say that, oh, you're so full of yourself or oh, you talk always about yourself, you know, so self-centered. Uh, I see what you're saying. Well, there's a lot, I, I mean, I can unpack a lot of, it's, this is, again, it's a big, it's a big one. And it's going to be relevant for a lot of people, right? So this is kind of like that question of belonging and who belongs and who does not belong. And I think, mm -hmm. honestly, I'm going to just say it. You might be project, I mean, even your professors coming into class might be caught up in their own question of do they belong or do they not belong. So this is endemic. I think that, you know, you, you might think that this is just you, but I think that this is really common and, and cuts across, you know, your department chair might think that the dean prefers a different department chair to them. <laughs> this is based on a true story that I'm telling you from a friend I know that was a department chair and she was telling me this is, you know, then, you know, all the, when all the chairs meet, the chairs are competing for the dean and have that same dance of who belongs and who doesn't belong. Thank you for, uh, Valdith is saying that she has to go. Thank you for, for jumping on. So, you know, so this is a big one. And so what I encourage people to do is a little bit of what I hear you already, where in your journey, you found the resilience inside to say, okay, what are my values? Where do I even want to belong? Do I need to belong here? Or can I find a different, you know, am I here for the purposes of getting my degree and I can find my people in my community elsewhere? And I think that this is good preparation because I mean, honestly, even when you have that graduate experience where it clicks and, you know, there is belonging, which I mean, few people really get more than one or two people in their program where they really feel they fit with, but that's a whole other, okay. but. Even then, when you look, life is long and a career is long, right? And so this can change when, you know, for me, I was well-suited. Like I got, I was, 
I enjoyed my, gra my years at graduate school. There was competition and shittiness and horrible people, but there was also, also a good group of you know, really great people, especially, you know, um, the international students. There was a lot of international students and like-minded Americans, and, and it was, it, right, we had our people. But then I went and started a new job and also became a mom at the same time. So suddenly I found myself in a totally different life, uh, a lot more isolated, cut away from that. So even if you have it, you can, you know, you got to teach yourself how to not depend on that. So not depend on it to come from academia necessarily too. If it happens, great. And if it doesn't happen, right, we need, so that's part of your journey. You're discovering these things already. Um, but, but, what happens when that question of belonging or not belonging becomes a part of the, uh, it, it becomes fodder for your writer's block, right? It becomes, so this is the thing with writer's block. It is a monster. It's like one of, it's like the blob, right? It just like, it absorbs more and more and more things and it grows until it contains the whole world. <laughs> Everything can become a part of what feeds the block. But again, a quick triage advice that I have for you, like just to tell you how I work with people who are blocked is at the heart of the block, there's a message that is actually useful M most of the time, right? There is something is not aligning for you that, that you need to change. And it, it's, if it's about the question of belonging, for example, right? So you need to peel the layers of how the, the block took everything in your life and everything became a part of the block. And, and, but you do need to kind of keep the, the baby and throw the bathwater and don't throw the baby with the bathwater by um, talking with your block, right? With the part, understanding what the block is trying to tell you. What is the message? Because it's a part inside of you that, that's blocking you. That goes like, I don't want, no, this is not working. I'm not going to show up to work if this is the environment, I am not supportive, right? So you need to understand that message. Um, and when you really address the, uh, what's at the heart, the linchpin, right? Then you can start making progress. And then the rest of the things that just kind of got into it, like, oh, I suck. And no, I don't really think I suck, but I don't feel like I belong. And this is making me feel isolated. And in this isolation, it's locking me out of my passion and I don't feel valued. Okay, I can try different things to restore that. You see, so it's, that's the work, is to really understand what is going on and, you, you know, investigate the block and explore the block for its gifts. I know it can sound so counterintuitive. When you are blocked, it feels like the worst thing in the world. It feels like you can survive without getting over the block somehow and just like blasting through it and do the product that you need to do in order to secure your survival. But it's, it's like exactly the other way around. You know, instead of blasting through the block, right? If the block, let's do a metaphor, right? You're on the road, there's a big rock and it's blocking you, okay? You can find out how much explosive to go and get to try to blast it or you can try to see if there's a way around it, but you can just quietly, very slowly find a way to get around it, right? Or I don't know, dig under, whatever, creative, you can start running with the metaphor, right? There's like, what is this rock? Why is it here? What in me brought this here? And sometimes it's gonna be a confluence of external and in, in circumstances and your internal response, but, we really do get blocked when we do, we're not willing to entertain that our block is a, a, a healthy response. And our psyche is protecting us from something by saying, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. This is not working. You know, this is not healthy. What's going on right now is not healthy. It's not working uh, for your well being. Maybe that's not the direction that you really want to take, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe your advisor is abused. It can be so many different things. But if we try to just ignore the block and just blast through it, it's like we don't accept the block. And that leads nowhere, <laughs> you know? So the first step is surrender. It really is it's this deep mind of mindfulness of like, okay, I am surrendering to the fact that this is happening. And before you surrender to the fact that this is happening, you cannot really start unblocking. Does that make sense? Is it resonating, Anoop, with uh, your experience? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. And uh, it's so much about self-intervention. It's about thinking through the process and 
sort of understanding where am I and why am I responding in this way and what can I do to, to protect myself, to care for myself. And uh, it's also not, uh, you know, being, com it's also knowing that you're complicit, but at the same time not giving in, you know, it's not uh, giving your worth, giving your value. Absolutely. Uh, but, but, you know, working it out, you know, what suits you best. And you would probably come out with some sort of a solution on your own. And, uh, right. and I think that's And I wonderful. will say more about this. This is so wonderful what you're saying. And I'll, I'll tell you another thing, like, you can come up with a different solution. The surrender piece, right, is when you're not trying to figure it out with your mind. Because our mind is wonderful, but it also is a noise machine, right? The mind continues, you know, pros and cons and pros and cons. This is not... I teach people that decision-making cannot happen with the mind. Your mind should, decision-making needs to come from a place of emotional clarity and from a place of inner knowing, you know, and some people are like more existential about it and they, you know, they know yes or no, and they can go for it. But the question is, do you go for it? You have inner knowing, but so sometimes you have a very clear inner knowing and you don't have the courage to go for it. Sometimes you're confused and you need to give yourself more time to ride like an emotional wave um, before you get clear and you have the clarity to move on. And what, you know, and, or sometimes, you know, you are stuck in chronic stress and fear and you have to find a way to, you know, it's so funny when people are trying to ride and I tell them, don't go do yoga, go take a walk. And they, you know, sometimes don't understand why is this going to help me, but letting go. You know, if you tried one thing and the one thing you tried was like, just do it and I'm going to sit there. And if I sat there for nine hours, it was enough. I'll sit there for 11 hours next time. And it's not working. Then you need to try a different approach, right? If all you have is a hammer, then everything's a nail. But what if you introduce a feather? <laughs> you know what I mean? What kind of instrument can you introduce that's great? I, you know, I'm just trying to engage all those images, so pay attention to another thing I'm doing, because that's an intervention. By engaging visual images, I am cutting through the middleman of your conscious mind, and I'm going right to the well of your unconscious thoughts, right? That's a very Jungian thing, right? And Carl Jung said, what we do not bring into consciousness from the unconscious appears in our life as fate, as destiny. So again, what we are not bringing into consciousness will appear in our lives at stake. So for example, my tenure denial, I really truly believe, was this kind of thing. I was not accepting that I'm kind of done with academia and I don't want to go back. Or I don't want to get stuck in this job that I had. But instead of me consciously saying that I was a matter of two and all the stuff happened and I needed the health insurance and blah, 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 blah. I was running in the maze. And a part of me that knew better was like, that bitch ain't listening. We're gonna shut that whole career, burn it down to the ground to the point that she cannot ever you know, go back, whatever. And I could, but, but you see what I'm saying? It appeared in my life as destinies from the outside, as tenure denial. Where in fact, you know what I mean? It was a manifestation of my, not the block itself, but the reason underneath that was, I was unfulfilled, I was in a toxic environment, I was not uh, able to, to, to do my contribution that I really wanted to do. And I was not aligned with my joy. And I'm a person that needs to be joyful. And you can see, I think, that this makes me joyful. So again, enough about me, back to you. I invoke a lot of, and that's what I invite you to do in your journaling, in morning pages. Um, go to a museum, expose yourself to beauty and art. Count that as work. That's process time. And that's the strength of process time. Count it as work because if you are only going to try to figure out things rationally, plus you're in a panic, so your rational mind is not even online, okay? Then you're just shit out of luck <laughs> because you are trying, trying, trying to rationally think your way out of something where your mind is not even its right mind. And thinking can only get you this far emotional clarity before you make a decision is a lot more important than you thought it all through because the mind can always come with a pro and a con and a pro and a con and I do this and I'll do that. And what that ends up looking like is that the mind is trying to control the outcome. I will do one, two, three. How many plans did I make while at the same time my inner intelligence, my body just went ahead and did something else? 
and the plan was great <laughs> and it was meticulous and it had a b c one two three and nothing of that plan happened but i just watched as i went ahead and did something completely different and it was great you know what i mean so allow yourself to align with that inner knowing and that comes with the patience to weave order out of confusion that's from the itching the ancient chinese book of I'm, I'm giving it all today right weave order out of confusion so what does that tell you before you can make a breakthrough you need to tolerate chaos. You need to allow yourself to be with confusion. You can't make sense of something that already makes sense. You need to be with the not making sense phase of the making sense process. Got it? Good. All right, question comments. I'll say a couple of, uh, uh, you see me still uh, on here and I'm wondering if, uh, uh, if you wanted to, to say something because I see here. Oh, um, yeah. thanks. Thanks for the presentation. It was great. Uh, I'm in media and communication studies too, and working on television. Yeah. Oh, a television um, scholar. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> where uh, Where are you in the world? Uh, Kent State, Ohio. Oh. Fantastic. Yeah. And so um, you, thanks. This, this it was helpful. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So, okay, I, I thought you were you, you had a, if you had a question or wanted to to share where you were. So, okay, if not, I will just say a, a quick couple of things about the class. And I know not everybody that's on here, my, but this is going on the group, so I want this to be uh, on the group as well. So, uh, the class specifically this time. So, I taught this class many times already in a local writer studio here in where I live. I'm in Decatur, Georgia, which is in the perimeter in Atlanta area. Uh, but I also taught it uh, online on my group and it went great. Uh, last time I taught it, it was summer and everybody had a lot of time. So I did six meetings of three hours each like this. And you can see that this is exhausting. So since my thinking about the timing of this class is that it's again leading up to the winter break that most, most academics have, um, I try to make it so much more manageable by dividing the content delivery um, into We'll see how I can, I, I, I hope it doesn't become like an hour and a half, but like I want to make them like 25 to 35 minutes, like hard hitting, just me going through the PowerPoint and pre-recorded. So I don't, because usually what happens is I get in the PowerPoint, but people are in the Zoom call. So I stop to explain and it becomes an hour and a half, which is great. But again, I'm trying to do something else this time. So it's going to drop every Saturday, beginning October 24th. Um, the, uh, pre-recorded content drops on Saturday with all the readings and not everybody's going to be able to do all the readings and it's, it's not mandatory. I will talk through the uh, readings and everything, but if you can do the readings, I always order them in order of like, what's the most important thing I want you to read, right? And then it's there for you. It's all uh, on a Facebook group that's organized as a, a, a educational group. So there are units. So every week you get a unit with all the readings, and exercises and things that you can choose to do if you have the time or get back to circle back and, and it can be self-paced is what I'm trying to say. So you get the content, which is 25 to 35 minutes. Uh, the PowerPoint would also be there, the readings in PDF and for free. So all of those, you know, you can see back here, there's like a lot more books that I have on the creative process, like the best of the best extract from there, curated for you and then, uh, Sunday, uh, starting Sunday. Um, so now I'm trying to remember what I did, whether the week, so I think November 1st, so October 24th, right, Saturday. On Saturdays, I will be dropping the content and the Sunday after, not the day after, but the Sunday after you're getting the workshop. So you had a week and a day to engage with the content. And then we do a workshop like this in a Zoom call, an hour, an hour and 15. Uh, I am still waiting to see, I have people from Hong Kong and people from Norway and people from the United States. So I'm still trying to figure out, I'm gonna wait for everybody to enroll and find how to get the right timing for everybody. Uh, I'm sure some people will have to, you know, also watch it after it's recorded. Uh, but if, if it's really horrible in terms of people are over, I might do two shorter ones. So one for the people let's say in Hong Kong and wherever, Australia, and one for, so we'll figure it out. So we'll be creative, we'll see about that. But so what you, what you get is the pre-recorded content 
the readings, the PowerPoint, exercises, a week to engage, an encouragement to share what you are doing with your friends, the community, on the Facebook group. If people on the group uh, indicate that it's helpful for them for us to do stuff like happy hour where we're all writing uh, and I give you writing prompts and you work while we just co-work, right? A co-working. I'm happy to, to offer these things, but that will be based on things that come up in the class. We'll say, well, this week, do you want to try to co-write and right? But I will definitely do different things to make sure that people are engaging each other while we're doing the class. So there's a community part component to it, right? And so again, as I said, it's 10 weeks designed to be really small chunks and manageable or the first five weeks, it goes from looking at uh, the academic environment as a problematic environment for writing, the writer's block, the procrastination, the, the like, different things that can manifest, all the science behind the writer's block, the psychology, you know, like the, because we are academics, we want to know what's going on, we want to understand the research behind our experience. And then practicing those little interventions. You start every week, I'm introducing another very low key, very doable, manageable, small intervention like morning pages or something called the artist date. Or, you know, we'll, I'm going to hold back and not say everything, but like little things that uh, and exercises that can help. Um, dreamstorming and not just brainstorming, for example. That's not like, so a lot of really useful tools I gleaned from all of the literature on creative writing and creative unblocking and the writer's block. And so we move from that, then there's gonna be a whole chunk that talks about time, not just time management, but um, your relationship with time. Uh, you know, we explore wounds, emotional wounds that you carry from your parents' relationship with time, et cetera, you know, like onto, uh, Again, interventions that help you be more at peace with your natural rhythm. So we will explore what your real rhythm is. What do we look at to understand it? How do we adjust when things change, et cetera? And then we will talk about the timetable for a project. The academic time that, what I said before, uh, Mara, uh, when we were talking about, you know, you falling out of sync with the time, you know? So we will talk about all of these things and how do we organize a project from A to Z and finish it, you know, from start to finish. So we will talk about something called start time versus middle time versus end time in a project and understand how that looks, et cetera, et cetera. All right, then we start moving into craft. Um, and again, this is so, a lot of the time people want, they think they want that part of the class, but what they really need is the unblocking part. But, you know, so, and some people really want the unblocking part. Like Yael that was here before said she wanted the unblocking part. She didn't think she needed the craft part. But really, if you heard what she said before, the craft part took her to that next level. Um, and she found it so useful. So when we get into the craft part, and I'm not, you know, going to get too much into that, but I will just say I am adapting, and this is my book in progress, all of that advice that comes from that um, journalism and creative nonfiction and serious nonfiction world where people are talking about narrative conventions and, and, and um, poetic mechanisms or like tricks or rhetoric, rhetorical devices that academics sometimes don't perceive to be part of what we can utilize in order for us to conceptualize structure and then execute a really good piece of academic writing. But if you understand things like acts, first act, second act, third act, if you understand things like uh, complication resolution models, right? When you tell a story, something has to go wrong, right? So you start with an equilibrium, things are somewhere, and then there's a complication, and the rest of the story is trying to resolve the complication, right? So this is a theory from narrative but it can be so useful to think through a dissertation, for example, right? Because you are presenting, here's where the research and here's the complication that I see and here's how I'm gonna resolve it. Just one example, right? But I'm giving a very uh, general description, but we go into the fine, nitty gritty, really practical things that can really help. So we do that kind of work. And then we talk about back to practice drafting, revising, 
uh, we go later, we go into publishing. You know, how does that work in the real world when you're working with the review process? How do you get a book under contract with a press? How do you get an article into a journal? How, you, do you want to edit a collection? How do you get that under contract? How do you organize a panel for a conference? Etc. 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 So really, I am I am positioned to to really give information about any kind of professional development. You know, in my again, you can go check my CV and stuff. You know, I was a relentless conference organizer, and out of organizing conference and conference panels, come successful collaborative projects like special journal issues or you know uh, edited collections or co-authored pieces, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is this, uh, I call it the life cycle of the academic paper, right, of, or even of the academic idea. You start with an idea, you, you do the research, but what products come out of it? There is a, a life cycle for each academic project and more than one product can come out of it. For example, a dissertation is just one product that can come out of your research. Out of the same data, out of the same research, you can write a popular nonfiction, serious nonfiction book. Uh, you can write journal articles. You can, you know, write a white paper. I mean, depending on, on you know, some people, you know, go into policy and government jobs, and it can be based on that same dissertation, right? So we really open up understanding how you can, you know, maximize the potential of you expressing your curiosity and what got you to want to do this work to begin with through learning how to write and how your own writing can open doors for you. And it doesn't just have to be the traditional, it can be, and I'm definitely well suited to teach you how to, you know, navigate that world, but I'm also well suited to teach you how to uh, allow your curiosity to pay attention what doors are flying open that are not maybe the traditional doors. Um, so that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. If there's any other question, I really, it's really good to know if, oh, pricing, because people I know are interested. So the special, the early bird special rate expired yesterday, but I was going to say this earlier, but like for people on this call and anybody want it, really interested, I am willing to extend that. Uh, if you let me know that you're interested through this weekend. So I'm really, I'm willing to extend that. If you are honestly struggling, underemployed, precariously employed, etc., I will work with you to find a way to give you a scholarship or a, a discount or a, a plan. The uh, price is 497 for 10 weeks. It's uh, what these classes are usually priced for in, you know, like creative writing classes. The early bird special is $100 less. It's 397. I am willing to do a three. Uh, a, three payment plan that usually I, um, if I do any discount like the early bird special or the plan, I do need to upcharge for the fees. Uh, so we can talk more about that. Although I'm open to things like Amazon gift cards because then there's no fees. Uh, but if it's PayPal and it's fees, I can't absorb the fees. So we can talk about that. But the point being, I want you to take the class and pay the, the ticket price, but I also want you to take the class. So if you cannot pay and it's genuine, I will work with you to find a way to do the class if you feel that that's the right thing for you at that minute in time. And, and, and I can be creative about that. So no, no need to uh, say more about that, but just so you know, it is possible to reach arrangements with me to allow you to take the class, especially once it starts making and I have enough people that are using their research money. So that's another point, research money. You can use, if you have research and development money, there are no conferences this year. So many people are taking that money and universities so far, I've, no, I've had no problem in universities in three continents. In, you know, Hong, people from Hong Kong use research money, people from Norway, all over the United States. I have people working. At, it's really interesting. A lot of Ivy League people work with me and you know, their universities are just very happy to pay for a, a, very, a premium $2,000 coaching package uh, for writing. Yes, they, that's, it's a nice little thing. And, you know, so I am also selling these coaching uh, premium packages, uh, but they, they are, yeah, again, working one-on-one -on -one is more expensive, more expensive. So that's another thing I want to say. And again, if you're interested or you know of friends who are interested, Share the, share the information. 
you get so much one-on-one -on -one time with me when you take the class. You know, you, you get a uh, FaceTime with me. You know, it, it, there is no other structure of paying for time with me. It's going to get you so much time with me for so little. Because when we have a group and everybody's paying what they're paying together, I, you know, it, uh, it's enough funds to offset my costs of doing the class. And you get, naturally, you get more time with me. So let me know if you have any more questions or comments. If you want to take the class and you feel like you cannot afford it, um i want to know about it even if you end up not taking it, it it's important valuable information for me because i'm trying to find a you know the price is right like enough for me to not lose money on making <laughs> on doing the class um because again doing private clients you heard you heard my rate so you know it's, a, it's a, but i really love teaching this class and i see it also as a as a community service in a way it's not not for profit but it's also not for crazy profit it's the best thing for your back working with me if you can take the class. So that's, that's my little pitch. And everybody feels uncomfortable. And I feel uncomfortable asking people for money. But hey, you know, I don't draw a university paycheck. So this is my business. All right, my friends. Any more questions or comments? It's really useful. Mara? How do we contact? How do we contact you? Do we contact you via Facebook or? That's, um... Yeah, uh, on Facebook. Uh, also uh, through my email and I put that on, so let me put this here again, but it's all over my group uh, where there's details for the class. So it's Sharon Sha 12 at gmail.com. That's my email, but I'm always looking at the message requests even from people who are not friends on Facebook. But definitely if you want to take the class, you can ask me for, to add you as a friend so we can DM, that's fine too. Um, so yeah, and I accept PayPal and again, internationally, so that's a whole thing. PayPal, if you have an account with them or you have balance, then you can send to friends and there's no fees and that's perfect. But for a lot of people doing this internationally, their rates are ridiculous. They take 4.4% mm -hmm. extra plus 30 cents for, and then they change it too. But, and they don't tell you before you send the money what they're going to deduce on my end. So they're so sneaky about it. I was on the phone with them for hours yesterday because I was like, you know, what is the, and then if they, what they want me to do is to send a money request to people, but then it's 7%. And then you pay the 7%. They're just sneaky like that. So I, I am looking deeply into finding other solutions. But I mean, honestly, I have two kids. We buy shit on Amazon all the time. I'm happy to do an Amazon gift card. And that's a really nice workaround for international um, people because, and I know not everybody loves Amazon, but you know, I don't love Facebook either, but what am I going to do? This is where my community, you know, um, you know, we, we're trying to do the good thing, the, the, you know, to enjoy the good things about that. You know, well, we don't like that our democracies are ruined, but at least we can have a, a good community experience for academic writers. <laughs> We lose. All right, friends. Other questions? Because these are really good questions that I know, I, you know, in my mind, I know all the details, so I forget what people need to know sometimes. No more questions. Good. All right, my loves. I really enjoyed so much talking to you. And again, no strings attached. I would be happy to see your lovely faces in the class. Um, I really do believe in this class deeply because I see what happens to people, you know, who take this class. And I, I will say this, the creative unblocking, you cannot decide ahead of time what would flow. Like sometimes it changes your life in ways that uh, are unpredictable, but always very joyful. I do believe we all are here as once in a lifetime cosmic events, you know, humans being born and we have something unique that we are here to do. And nothing gives me more joy than helping people align with that, that passion. And it could be many different things in many stages of your life. You know, I thought I would forever be Professor Shaha. And for some people I am, um, but I am unlocking a whole other passion and it's fun, it's adventurous too. So you can have many different lives and I wish you love and light on whatever your journey takes you. All right, my friends. Happy weekend. We made it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let me know if you have questions Bye. or want to join. All right. I'm ending the class for all.